Everybody ready? Okay. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I am going to call this meeting of the Albany City Council to order. Uh, we are going to start with our land acknowledgement, uh, which will be read by Councilmember Lopez. The city of Albany recognized that we occupy the land originally protected by the Confederated Villages of Lishan. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Ohlone tribe. We thank them for their contributions which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The city of Albany commits to sustain an ongoing relationship with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Uh, with that, we will go to roll call. City Clerk, who I believe is online, can we please have the roll? Um, Council Member Hanson Romero? Here. Council Member Jordan? Here. Council Member Lopez? Here. Vice Mayor Mickey is absent, and Mayor Tiedemann? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to ceremonial matters, uh, which we have one item that I think most of the room is here for. Uh, this is our proclamation recognizing the AMS softball team in their 2023 season. And uh, Councilmember Hanson Romero, could you please read the proclamation? In recognition of the AMS Softball Club team 2023 season, whereas the Albany Middle School Cobras have not had a softball team since 1980s to represent our community, and whereas the softball program was given an opportunity to start again in the spring of 2023 as a club team after students approached school leadership personnel to advocate for a team, followed by the support of parents and whereas the Albany Middle School softball club team not only had a rebirth, but also represented the Albany community in the league championship game on May 23rd, 2023, and whereas the teammates of the softball club team not only fielded a competitive roster, but also highlighted the value and impact of intentional inclusivity, community support, and patience. And whereas the individuals who helped facilitate the reemergence of a team to represent Albany Middle School include, but are not limited to, Albany Middle School Principal Eric Mapes, Albany Unified School District's Athletic Director Bill Tressler, Coach Bo, and dedicated parents Robert De La Rosario, Paul Fine, and Paul McLaren, and whereas the coaches and parents exemplify the commitment that our youth ought to be entitled to their academic and social success, underscoring impacts of community investment towards academics and extracurricular activities. And whereas it is fundamentally important that the young women who participated as student athletes be formally acknowledged for their sacrifices and bravery in showing up every week for practices and games. And whereas seldom are women student athletes afforded equitable levels of visibility and appreciation for their respective achievements or accolades. Now, therefore, the City Council, Albany City Council does hereby recognize the Albany Middle School Cobras softball team, club teams, coaches, and players for all their successes in representing the City of Albany with pride, resilience, integrity, and excitement. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, we will now hand out uh, individual proclamations um, to anyone who's here to receive them. Uh, if you hear your name, please come up uh, to accept them. Starting with Melanie Vega. Oh, I, I don't want to butcher this name. <laughs> Amara Batiste. Arielle Seha. Is that correct? Ariel? Oh, she's not here. Okay. Chloe Del Rosario. Daria Laridge. Yay! 
Emma Guy. Genesis Monet Ford. Isabel Rodriguez. Uh, Kaja Davidson. <laughs> Layla Souza Bush. <laughs> they must be practicing. <laughs> Liliana Muscardine. <laughs> Madison Doss. Theodora Engel. <laughs> Maya Oswald. <laughs> Mal Malia McLaren. <laughs> Rachel Engwall Reef. Sally Einstein. <laughs> Vivian Hale. <laughs> Bo Bonini. Robert Del Rosario. And Ryan McLaren. Go Cobras. Uh, I don't know if the coaches or anyone else would like to say anything. But feel, feel free, yeah. Can we get the uh, public comment microphone? Or, or that one. Yeah, that one works. Good evening, uh, Robert Darrell I think you know me as uh, someone who works on transportation issues, but I'm coming here with a different hat on today. Um, and uh, I really want to thank the, the council for the proclamation and recognition. Um, as is stated, I think the, actually the proclamation said a lot of the things that I wanted to say, but this is the first team in, in 40 years, and so it's really exciting for us to get together um, and have this amazing team. We really weren't sure what to expect. Uh, we had 17 players come out um, who were all amazing. Um, Majority of them had never played softball before um, in, in any type of organized capacity, and we didn't get any practices in because of rain. So it rained, you know, for, for months on the beginning, and we were practicing in the AMS gym. Um, and so we went from a team that was just learning the game to one that made it to the, the championship of the East Bay uh, Middle School League, consisting of schools from Oakland, Berkeley, Albany, and El Cerrito. So we're really proud of that, um, that feat. Um, I, yeah, it is great. <laughs> I do have to give a lot, if not all the credit, to, to Coach Bo. Um, also, um, she's a special ed teacher with Albany Unified, a local softball coach, a Cal softball alum, um, but her compassion and her ability to motivate this team to always do their best and feel inspired is all due to her magic touch of coaching the game that she loves. Um, I also want to thank Coach Ryan um, for showing up on the first day of practice and saying, hey, I want to be a coach. I'm like, all right, <laughs> you are a coach. Here's our assistant coach. Um, but he shared those same values of, of compassion and positivity. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the players and families uh, for giving their all and creating an environment outside 
outside of the everyday challenges of middle school, um, where kids from all backgrounds came together as a true team, where it was okay to make mistakes as long as you tried your best and had fun along the way. Um, youth sports is definitely a major commitment, so to have the families that we had, including our own council member Lopez, support the team by taking their kids to practice, loudly cheering us at games. We had the loudest crowds of, of all of our games. Um, and donating their time and, and, and resources uh, really, really made the team success. So, so I really thank you um, for this proclamation. Bo, Ryan, a couple of words. Ryan had a lot. <laughs> uh, good evening. Good evening, Ryan McLaren. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, recognizing our softball team. It was an honor to uh, coach these young, young uh, humans that are going to do great in this world. They each came out. Uh, like Coach Rob said, some have never played. They gave it their all. They never quit. Um, we had lots of ups and downs <laughs> through the season, and uh, they pulled through, and they never gave up, and uh, I'm so proud of them. Uh, they, all, they will each do great things in life. And, uh, um, you know, when you see these uh, young ladies go out and uh, – um, not knowing the game and the love they had for it at the end and that they became great teammates to each other um, at school the, the new friendships they got is is so amazing and uh, I'm proud to be a coach and um, you know Rob Rob said it, it's coach Bo uh, she's the, the best coach I've ever uh Coached with her compassion, her uh, her sense of the game. Uh, you could learn from your mistakes. There's no there's no mistake. It was you learned from it. You moved on, and that's what everybody needs in their life. You know, you make a mistake, you learn from it, and you move on. And without her, we wouldn't be here. And uh, also for Coach Rob, he uh, he put this together with a few other coaches. He dedicated a lot of time, so thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for the kind words. And I was not planning to be here tonight, and I spontaneously was able to make it happen. And so without having anything, having anything prepared, I do want to say thank you very much for your support. And thank you to all the players for coming out day in, day out, giving it your, your best. Uh, and especially to the families. As you mentioned, Rob, it's a huge commitment to play sports. It's a huge commitment. Monetarily, time-wise, your family dynamics suffer sometimes because of uh, your commitment to, uh, to being there. We acknowledge that. We appreciate you so much for bringing the kids out. It's only going to get better. Uh, super stoked for next year. Whether that was a commitment that I'm coming back or not, I don't know. <laughs> I did not check that out at home, but uh, whoever is doing it, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And uh, I'll pass on some notes. Uh, and not enough can be said about what Rob did for our team this year. Rob was everywhere all the time doing all the things. Even we had a playoff game. Rob was out of town for work. He was still running the Game Changer app for us. We'd be like, hey, there's two outs. He's like, okay, two outs. You put it in. <laughs> it, it. You know, not a lot would have gotten done without this guy right here. So thank you, everybody, for an awesome year. Thanks for having us here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all you've done for us. Uh, Council Member Lopez. <laughs> Go Cobras. Thank you very much to the coaches for being here and commenting. Um, we will now go to public comment on this item where people have three minutes. Um, and if uh, anyone would like to, you can line up along that wall uh, to make public comment in the room. Or if you're online, uh, press star nine or press the raise your hands button. We're going to do those in the room first. And I see we already have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for those who uh, don't know me, uh, my name's uh, Brian Doss. Um, I am the proud father of Madison. Um, it was really um, exciting, you know, uh, watching her participate uh, in softball um, this season, um, along with all of her classmates. It was really exciting. But I wanted to take a moment um, to uh, thank the coaches 
I uh, really appreciate them taking the time to do this. They didn't have to do it. It wasn't required, um, but, but they did, and they took the time. Um, as for Coach Bo, Coach Bo has a gift. Um, I don't know if you've all, all ever had the opportunity to watch her work um, with the students, but it is an amazing thing uh, to watch, uh, whether it's someone who's uh, really challenging and having like a tough time and trying to figure it all out, uh, or someone who hasn't discovered their love for the game yet, but they discover it through Coach Bo because she makes you love the game um, and, and shows you why it, it's such an um, amazing uh, sport to play. Um, and so, you know, on behalf of the parents, I just wanted to, you know, thank, uh, thank you for that commitment uh, to, our, uh, to our students, uh, to our players. Um, and Game Changer, it was mentioned like a little bit, but I wanted to like dive into it just a little bit more. It is the most confusing app. <laughs> And I, and I work for a tech company. Like, that's what I do for work. <laughs> and, and I can admit that uh, Coach Rob was like, Brian, can you run Game Changer for me one game? Because I can't do it. And I'm like, no problem. Like, I, I work in tech. I got this. I, like, pulled it out for 30 seconds and was like, he needs a raise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you for taking that on. Um, it was great. Um, there were a couple of games that um, Madison wasn't able to make it to, but I felt like we were there uh, because we were watching it through Game Changer. Um, and we were, like, cheering, and everybody was wondering why I was yelling at my phone. But, like, we were able to um, be, you know, participate, you know, because, you know, he was running the Game Changer. So I really appreciated that. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I take opportunity to thank the coaches, take opportunity to thank the players for getting out there, for being brave, for taking this on uh, for the first time in 40 years. Um, and then I wanted to take a moment to thank my fellow parents for getting the kids there to practice, getting them to the games, figuring it out, um, and being supportive and being positive, you know, the, the whole time. Like, there wasn't, like, one time where one parent would, like, got down on a different player. Everybody was, like, supporting everybody and cheering everybody on. And it was a really fun experience to be a part of. So I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for that. And, and thank you, um, Mayor and, and, and Council members, for recognizing uh, these amazing uh, young people. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. We have another, and I don't know if that public comment microphone is working, but there we go. It's working. Um, well, I, this was not planned, but I want to say I am totally inspired by all these young people. Um, it's exciting, and I feel guilty bringing you back to some mundane city business after all that. Um, I sent you all letters via email today. I'm not sure if you all had to read it. I know Councilmember Lopez has, and he responded to me, and I appreciate your thoughtful comments. Um, I live on the 800 block of Adams Street. Um, can I pause you, because we are going to take public comment on uh, good of the city after this. Um, so this is comment on the proclamation specifically. Can you stick around for a couple oh, minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was public next? comment. No, just on the proclamation, and then we'll do good of the city right after we do the city manager's report. I beg your pardon, and congratulations to all you young people. No problem. Uh, anyone else in the room? If not, uh, we'll go to online. City clerk, are there any commenters online? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Good evening, uh, middle school softballers. This is Jeremiah Garrett Pinguello. Um, I just wrapped up my season. I was umpiring for Albany Little League uh, this season. And I just I just want to say, you know, thank you for being out there and uh, being part of a team. You know, I played baseball my whole life in Albany. And um, when you play softball, uh, it's, just, it's a team sport. And you realize that it takes to four points, and it's just... You learn a lot of teamwork, a lot of cooperation, develop friendships. So um, way, to, way to go, kids, and um, keep up the good work. And uh, thanks for being a great team in Albany. Thank you for your comment. City Clerk, are there any further folks online? No, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, any comments from council? I'll just chime in here. I. Uh, I was on Albany Berkeley Girls Softball League, like one of the first teams around because we didn't have, you know, softball at Albany Middle School where I went. 
So um, I'm just really proud of all you guys uh, for getting together and like pushing this through. Um, I was also part of Albany Middle School when we started the girls wrestling team way back when. So it really does take, you know, somebody to really want something and go for it. And, you know, I just admire all of you guys for that, for going after your dream and doing what you want to do and making a change in our community. So thank you all and keep playing ball. <laughs> Um, plenty of you have interacted with me before, and I'm sharing this now, and, you know, wearing my hat as a city council member to just express, like, how proud I am of all of you, um, and that you should never take this as a, you know, a light moment in your life. Like, uh, this exemplifies, uh, what your patience and persistence can result in, and that you deserve, at the proclamation stated, to be acknowledged for what you've done, because very seldom do people who play on team sports ever make it to the championship game. And you all did that in your first season. Uh, it felt like I was like living in the reality of bad news bears. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it was fun. Um, and I can attest to uh, Mr. Doss's comments about his frustration with the app because I was right there and witnessed it. And he went straight to, to first base coach instead. Um, <laughs> But uh, I also just want to acknowledge uh, a special moment that ha happened during that championship game when uh, one of our players, uh, Vivian, made it on base for the first time this season and ended up scoring. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I, you know, I just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, and I think it's safe to say I speak on behalf of the whole council, we are all very proud of you, and we look forward to see what you do in future years. Some of you are going to Albany High next year, and we look forward to seeing what uh, you could bring to Albany High, because we know they had a good season, too. Um, and again, just thank you, parents, for coming out here and allowing them to have, have their moment uh, right now, right here. I'll just briefly echo what everyone has said. Thank you all for being here and all your work this season. Uh, you know, the part of the meeting that comes after this is not nearly as fun as you all actually being here. That doesn't mean you can't stick around if you want to, but I encourage you to go get ice cream or something. Uh, and uh, again, just thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work. I hope any of you who are going to Albany High continue as uh, from my experience there, we weren't that amazing at a lot of the boys sports, but we always dominated the women. So hopefully everyone keeps going. Um, and thank you again. Thank With that, we move to the city manager's report. Once the room has died down, uh, City Manager, can we please have your report? Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> well, we have some pictures, at least, here. So, um, city manager report for this evening. I'd like to recognize all of the work that went into the events that were held this past Sunday, June 18th, both the Strollish summer event as well as the Albany Juneteenth celebration. Um, great turnout at these events and a nice overlap of the two all the way up and down the avenue. Uh, here are some photos here from our staff that were able to get out and about at the event, and really just appreciation for the leadership and initiative that went into this, um, especially uh, from Abrams Clayhorn Gallery for continuing to do all of the heavy lifting and coordinating this event. So we look forward to seeing it again next year, as well as the continuation of all the <laughs> Strollish events. I know those are both a lot of work. and much appreciated by the community. Coming around the corner is another event, 4th of July in Memorial Park. This is um, a combination event which will be both 
live bands, food trucks, and um, family opportunities, including uh, kitty activities and something really for everyone in the community. So please take some time to come out. It will be from 11 to 3 on the 4th of July. We are doing work to inventory our city street trees and also conducting a planning process for a street tree management plan. We have a really, well, depending on how you, how you like um, uh, getting into websites, a pretty fascinating tool on our website now, which has been developed out of the street tree inventory. Uh, you can go to our website, this is uh, linked in our sustainability pages, um, and you can see all of the trees in our city, including their size and type of species and other uh, accompanying information. So this is the beginning of more work to come in terms of actively managing our urban forest and our trees on city streets. Um, the East Bay Mud Pipeline Relocation Project. We look forward to having the pavement restoration component of this conducted uh, beginning June 26th, so right around the corner. Please expect delays as that work is ongoing, but much appreciated that it is forthcoming. Uh, the project is expected to take about two to three weeks. Our police department recently launched a new area coordinator program. This is a program intended to provide a higher level service to our community by assigning personnel to individual sections of our city uh, so that people calling in with perhaps ongoing issues or concerns uh, speak to someone that will have a bit more depth in that particular area and able to follow up accordingly. You can see our website for the opportunities to connect there as well as the specific areas. And also, with regard to public safety, a sincere appreciation to the incredibly responsive and effective work that our fire department did in association with Berkeley, El Cerrito, and Richmond, as well as our police department in responding to a fire that occurred on June 13th um, down on Cleveland Avenue, the 500 block of Cleveland Avenue. The fire was brought under control around 10:15 but did cause some fairly significant damage. Um, also, uh, another concerning event on June 17th, our police department, fire department, and PG&E crews responded to a large scale power surge, causing down power lines and a loss of power to a significant portion of the city. Um, staff will be continuing to work with PG&E to better understand this occurrence and any uh, related concerns or proactive work we can do here. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? A little loud out there. Um, I had a quick question about the area um, coordinator um, for in totally fine if you don't have uh, the answer right at this moment, but who exactly fields those emails or those inquiries? Is it officer that's on patrol at that moment, or is it someone at dispatch or is anyone else on staff? Yeah, it's either a sergeant or a lieutenant in, in the office. So it, it's, um, it will be housed with one individual so that they have the consistency over time. Any further questions from council? Seeing none, uh, we will go to the public. Um, for persons desiring to uh, ask a question, you'll provide one minute um, to ask questions about the city manager's report. Um, city clerk, are there any uh, folks on Zoom? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is Jeremiah. Uh, so what's the best way for an Albany resident to get you know, pretty much instant notification when you know, there's a power outage like there was, or, or there's a fire in the local neighborhood. Um, is there, is there a, um, you know, a, an email that goes out from either Albany or Alameda County, um, you know, giving alerts? Uh, that way, you know, people could shelter in place if, in case there's smoke, or, um, you know, is there, is there a, a good way for the city to be notified? That's my question, thank you. Thank you. Uh 
City Clerk, are there any further folks online? No, that's it. Uh, city Manager, I don't know if we have that alert system. We sure do. Uh, city Clerk, I'm wondering if you might be able to pull that up on the screen in terms of our AC alert system. If you're able to, if not, I can follow up with the information. There is a sign up opportunity on our website. It's called AC Alert, and we do utilize it uh, regularly for this type of situation and utilized it for this past issue. Um, why some may not have received it is because this one was focused in a specific area. We have the ability to sector our messages or send them citywide. This is done through our public information officer in coordination with public safety staff. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that we received communication from a resident in the area that got blacked out by the, the grid failure, um, and he provided documentation that there was a failure at approximately or exactly the same location a couple of, a couple few years ago, uh, which is pretty disturbing. So I appreciate staff following up on those, given the recurrence, not necessarily of exactly the same cause, but the same area. Okay, that brings us to good of the city. Uh, this is for people wishing to speak on items that are not on the agenda. Um, you'll have three minutes. Uh, if you're online, please raise your hand or press star nine. And if you are in the room, please line up along this wall um, and come to the public comment microphone. Um, and we will start with the people in the room. So please, you can go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Sorry for not knowing your procedures. Um, I live on the 800 block of Adams Street, and my concern is the new traffic changes that, hap that the City Council approved for that street, making it a two-way bike road, um, but also making it kind of, sort of, maybe two-way for cars if you live on the street. But if you don't live on the street, then you can't go south on Adams. But if you live on Adams, I can go out my driveway and go south down to Solano. Um, consistently, through the week, when I go south on Adams, cars come up to me. They go to the side, we both pull to the side, but they shake their finger at me and they make funny faces and they tell me this is a one-way street, ma'am. You don't know what you're doing. And if they stop and we roll down our windows, I explain that it's changed and they usually say thank you, although some say go F yourself. You don't know what you're talking about and they go on. That's just a normal occurrence. Saturday, June 3rd, when I was going down south on Adams and I was on the right side of the road, a truck was coming towards me he deliberately pulled into the middle of the lane and stopped and would not let me pass. And he was explaining to me through hand gestures and various things that I was on the wrong side of the road, I was going the wrong way, and I didn't know what I was talking about and I needed to turn around. And he wouldn't budge. He got out of his car and was threatening me. He also was causing cars behind him to stop. At this point I got scared and I called the Albany police, got talked to the dispatcher, she, she also was uh, confused and she said, no, it's a, it's a one-way street for cars and it's two for bicycles. And when I explained to her I live on the street, I can go south unless you change the rules, she goes, oh yeah, you're right, it is confusing. She said I should come talk to the city council. Anyway, I sat there with people yelling at me. At one time I had three men surrounding my car, circling me, walking around, yelling at me, threatening me, making hand gestures and saying ugly things because I was too stupid and too old to know what I was doing and I was going the wrong way. I sat there for seven minutes and not one police officer arrived. Dispatcher told me right at the beginning, I've dispatched an officer, they will be there. Not they're busy someplace else, they'll get there as soon as they can, but they will be there. Seven minutes, not one arrived. Finally, the guy got tired. I had neighbors coming out because he was honking his horn, coming out, walking around my car saying, no, lady, you're stupid. It's bicycles two-way, not cars. Finally, he got fed up, got tired. Maybe he was no longer amused. I don't know. But he finally tried to go around me and get back. He was so close to my car, he almost hit me. He reached out his hand, shoved my rear view, my side view mirror so that he could get by. And then he left. Still, no police officer. I was shaking so hard, I was so terrified. I finally went on my way. Everybody left, I was there by myself, so I went on my way. There is no signage on that street. I'm sorry if I'm going over three minutes. The point is, you need to put signage on that street to let people know. Even the residents don't understand, but most of the people there are from out of town and they never received your little postcards. You need to have a sign maybe that says, Northbound traffic, northbound vehicles must yield to southbound vehicles. And on canes, reverse it. 
something to let people know that it is technically, yes, a two-way street, even though everybody still parks all the same way. I would like at some point the city council to address this, and I appreciate uh, Council Member Lopez's response to my email. Thank you for your comment. Next. Hello. My name is Jess Hutchison, and I have lived in Albany for 15 years. My husband and I moved here from San Francisco because we wanted to live in a smaller walkable town with a fun, charming, older downtown area. And a huge part of the appeal of Albany was the Albany Twin. It's always been my opinion that if a downtown can support a movie theater, then the urban ecosystem is working properly. So the reason I'm here today, of course, is the shocking news last week that Landmark is ceasing their operations at the Albany Twin Theater. Within a day or so, I had started the Friends of the Albany Twin group on Facebook to centralize all the information gathering and idea sharing for people in our community. Now we have over 200 members and more every hour, and we are very, very motivated to save the Albany Twin. So why save it? I could talk for several hours about my love for movies, how thrilling it is to see a movie in a darkened theater, alone but surrounded by other humans sharing in that sublime moment. But what I really want to focus on today is the importance of a theater as a crucial part of a healthy, thriving downtown. Theaters create dynamic movement. They bring in locals and folks from other parts of our area who then go to coffee shops or restaurants or bars and walk down the street. Any urban planner or designer will tell you how important street activation is to a thriving community. There are many great local examples of smaller theaters uh, closing and then getting resurrected as a thriving movie theater due to joint efforts of community groups and the city government. A great example of this is the Cerrito Theater, just down San Pablo in El Cerrito. And we are really thrilled that some of the folks involved in that effort are, um, have offered to help us out. It's still early days, but I would like to encourage the Albany City Council and the Zoning and Planning Commission to take up this matter for study. Please find out more about the property owner's situation, their intentions for the property, and potential options moving forward. We also ask that the council put this on the agenda for your next meeting. Um, we are very motivated to keep the theater open and operational and as a theater space that works for our entire community. I'm a mother of a 12 year old and I want him to remember how cool it was to grow up in a town like Albany with a wonderful little old theater that still played movies. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Good evening, my name is Carol Fitzgerald and I've been a resident of Albany since the late 70s. I'm uh, president of the Friends of Albany Hill. That's where I got my nature uh, juices going and just along Cerrito Creek. And now I'm also a member of the Friends of Albany Twins, which is where I got my cultural hit. So um, I don't know if you've been around the theater, but you have a community in mourning. It started with the collection of many people coming Thursday night, which was the last night, and uh, a few notes left, and the notes get added to every day. And today, there was a memorial wreath installed and little candle glasses and a big colorful ribbon on the ticket office. So, um, and Jess and I ran an information table by the theater on Sunday during the celebration to help people process to just come together and we had a steady stream of people so in the last few years the area on Solano from San Pablo up to the bar tracks has become just so alive day and night and it's the theater the restaurants the brewery the coffee houses various things just walking but it's a remarkable difference in the activity on Solano and we're concerned about the businesses, uh, how it's gonna affect them, because this did bring a lot of people in. And I attended almost every um, film they put there, because it's my kind of film. So here's my thing on 
theater, live theater and movies, uh, which is differs from streaming. That when I want to stream, I watch, you know, maybe Masterpiece Theater, whatever. Those are written in episode form to be seen just an hour. But the movie requires quite a bit of commitment. You spend a lot of money to get in. If you buy popcorn, you may eat out before or after. And in many cases, you hire a babysitter. But what you are doing is committing. So you go into that theater and you enter the artist's vision, the filmmaker, and you're in their world for a couple of hours. And this is wonderful to share with other people, which is why I like the big theater. And when you're at home and you have Netflix and you press the pause button to go to the refrigerator, to answer a call, whatever, you're not getting the same experience as when you are immersed in another world, the dreams of the filmmaker. So I'm hoping that we can find a way to keep this as a community space, either as a theater or shared in other ways. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next. Hi, I'm Bonnie Davidson. And um, a lot of people reached out. And I was really grateful to find the Facebook group that just put together for the movie theater. Um, you know, I, I really am disappointed to say I've never actually gone and seen a movie there because I have kids and it, there were never kids movies. But the value of that theater there and the historic status of that building and just how beautiful it is and what it brings to our city is really important. And I hope that the um, friends of the Albany Twin can work in collaboration with the city however we are able to gather information, to support with any, anything that's needed um, so that we can maintain a theater there and that the city will really help in preserving the status of that building as a theater and not having yet another place for our community to gather become just housing. So I think that's really the concern of the community is that we're going to just keep losing the spaces that offer activities and we're all for housing, but we also really want to make sure that we're balancing this and preserving the things that make our city great. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'm going to segue really quickly. And I also want to offer an appreciation to our first responders in Albany for last Saturday. Um, that was wild. And my business suffered greatly because we lost power for the longest out of any area for the second time in about five years from the same thing happening. Um, it was really challenging and it was really scary. We had a, a brewery full of customers and we had just two explosions happen. Um, the fire department stopped, the, the dispatch stopped being able to answer calls because so many people were calling in. We had people running home because they had older kids at home and lines by their house had gone. Um, and so I really hope that we put a little pressure on PG&E to make some changes <laughs> um, and to do some other things in our area so that we don't have to keep going through this and like running things from our freezers so we don't lose thousands more dollars of product to home freezers of everybody so that we can preserve it. Um, so whatever we can do as a city for that would be great. But again, I really want to appreciate the police officers and the firefighters who came out immediately and were escorting people safely around and making sure that nobody was injured in a time when I'm sure they were feeling really shocked as well. So that's all I have to say. And I appreciate that everyone's here and, and li listening to these comments. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments in the room? If not, city clerk, are there any folks online? Uh, good evening, City Council. This is Jeremiah. Um, I was wondering if if the city attorney ha or city manager has any um, new information regarding that fentanyl uh, class action lawsuit, I guess, with the state. Uh, maybe next meeting or, or sometimes we can get a, a brief uh, regarding that uh, and let us know what, what kind of money the city of Albany is acquiring for that lawsuit. And then we could talk about on the agenda, you know, where where is that money going to go? Um, is it going to go towards uh, fentanyl resources, such as um, distributing training and Narcan kits to local businesses um, or local residents? 
uh, something like that. So that would be really neat to uh, to get a presentation on um, once that happens. Also, uh, the the land acknowledgement statement. I've mentioned this before, and it it kind of it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's a land acknowledgement statement. Okay, we read it before every meeting as a formality, and it's kind of like that's it. I, I was wondering if the city plans on actually doing something, um, showing good faith, such as uh, displaying that la land acknowledgement statement um, on a plaque somewhere at City Hall, um, putting the land acknowledgement statement um, around town so people could actually see it. Because people attending a city council meeting or a public meeting, that's the only time you hear it. Um, one of my ideas is, you know how we have wel the new Welcome to Albany signs? Um, maybe on the back of the sign, the Landers Acknowledgement state Statement could be displayed um, on the back of the sign or somewhere on the sign. Um, just, just more public view of, of the Land Acknowledgement Statement. I envisioned it right there above uh, uh, Preston, Aaron, and Robin, right, right up there above the city council, above the city Albany seal, that white strip up there. I envisioned the land acknowledgement statement being displayed right in the city hall, right up top uh, someday. That would just be really nice and it would be a show of good faith, like uh, the city of Albany actually cares and is, is doing something to, um, to keep the relationship going. Also, oh yeah, I was wondering if anybody's aware of the Albany Subaru right there, um, across from Happy Donuts, um, across from the seafood restaurant. There's an Albany Subaru and they have a, a parking lot across the street. And daily, time after time, their, their workers run across San Pablo playing the, the game of Frogger with their lives. And I went down there and talked to the manager and he says, no, we're not gonna allow our employees time to walk to um, Solano and cross the street light. They have to run across the street and risk their lives. They're not even issued a safety vest. So regarding public safety, I hope someone looks into the serious jaywalking uh, going on with that Subaru um, dealership. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Evening, Mayor and Council Members. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Nick Pilch, uh, Albany resident, and I wanted to speak about the Albany Twin Theater as well. As you know, movie theaters, the theaters have been and continue to be lost everywhere. These are special places, some might say magical places, and they are community spaces. There's nothing that matches seeing a film with others and laughing and crying together and seeing a film on a big screen. There are also places that can be used for many things, such as live drama and music performances for the community and possibly for the school district. For about three years around 1990, I lived near the Van Ness Corridor in San Francisco at Washington and Franklin Streets, and I could walk to about 10 different independent movie theaters, all of, but of which, all of which uh, but one are gone now. I watched a movie at the Twin on Thursday night, that last night, and spoke to some people after the showings let out, and I'm so grateful that there are people who care about preserving uh, the Twin for the city as well. <clears throat> I think we should save this space. Among all the other things that the theater brought and brings to the city, I think the theater is a big part of the economic development of the city. The more people come to see movies or plays or music at the theater, the more they frequent our restaurants and other businesses on the street. Uh, you should note that a huge draw, the Albany Film Fest, has had to relocate to the El Cerrito Theater for this year. Really unfortunate. Time is of the essence with, the matter, with this matter. The owners of the buildings may be trying to sell the building and or the land in order to satisfy bankruptcy proceedings. I ask that you agendize a discussion of what the city can do to help save this building at the very next city council meeting. And I ask that you also add this to the work plan of the Planning and Zoning Commission so that all relevant uh, zoning and other considerations can be serviced. Now, I understand very well that our city is financially constrained and has a small staff, but what I'm asking is that the city look into whatever it can do 
such as uh, zoning considerations and any support, no matter how small, of the volunteers who are now coalescing around an effort to try to save this space uh, for the community, for potentially multi-purpose, for potentially the school district. Uh, think about the Albany marquee. How many photos of Albany contain that marquee? Maybe half of them, maybe not that many, but quite a few. It's quite iconic for the city. Think of what it would mean to lose that marquee. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Hi, um, this is Elaine Stelton. Um, I own a small apartment building near uh, the Albany Movie Theater, near the Twin. And um, I do think losing the theater will definitely change the character of the neighborhood. As one of the speakers said, you know, it's one of the few activities we can all do as a community. Um, you know, it's a shared experience and it's a joy, and I really think it'll be a terrible loss to the community to lose the Albany um, Twin Theater. So I would urge the city to do whatever they can. I, and again, I understand all the constraints that are in place, but whatever is possible between, you know, private, the private sector and the city um, should be done to try and maintain the theater. Um, also, just speaking to what Jeremiah said about the land acknowledgement, um, the city has put their money where their mouth is. They, as far as I can remember, they gave $30,000 to the Ohlone tribe out of their general fund. Um, nobody, no other community has done that. That is head and shoulders above <laughs> anywhere surrounding us. So I think you have done a very fine job um, in Albany of showing what you think is important and putting money behind that. And I thank you for doing that. Have a great evening. Thank you for your comment. Are there any more? Mayor, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, there were a couple questions there that I think we can briefly respond to. Um, one or two that I can do and then I'll stop toss it over to staff first on the land acknowledgement uh, is correct we did give Shumi um, we have also on those signs that welcome people to Albany it does say uh, that it is Ohlone land and we did have a ceremony when we installed those with uh, the uh, confederated villages um, so that uh, was always our intention and has been done we do fly a flag uh, to that effect as well so we are putting this information out there in a variety of forms um, on the Albany Twin, uh, I'll, I know our staff has started to reach out and gather information on this um, because we know various people are uh, considering it and, and concerned. Um, I'll add that uh, I know some of the folks who were involved in the Cerrito um, and have started gathering information on that as well. It may or may not be possible, but we are working on it and seeing what, if anything, can be done. Um, Staff, I don't know if there's any. Sure, Mayor, I, I think that recaps it perfectly. Um, <coughs> staff is also working. <laughs> Can you mute? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yes, we're working in coordination with the property owners as well to understand their interest in um, opportunities and what that may look like from their perspective and also sharing the concerns being raised by our community members. So we hope to have more information shortly, but um, are working to schedule a meeting to that regard. Great, thank you. Um, there was also a question on the fentanyl class action lawsuit we've mentioned before. I'm betting we don't have an update, but if we do. Yes, so um, we will work out all the details once I can touch base with city attorney Subramanian, but um, Albany is on the list of participating subdivision cities, so there's some amount of money that is coming to the city, but probably what happened, because most small cities did this, is the money went to the county for use in the city and in other cities in the county. But um, the money that was earmarked for the city probably went to the county to be used within the city. So um, that, I think, is what happened, but this is all, you know, we can confirm by going back through the settlement documents, but that's, that's my understanding. So we will um, confirm and touch base with you all on that shortly. Great. 
Thank you, Substitute City Attorney, and thank you for being here and filling in tonight. Um, then lastly, we had uh, a mention of the Adam Street pilot program. Um, uh, City Manager, I think we are preparing a more detailed response, but I don't know if you want to sure, give a short yeah. response. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the concerns expressed and certainly not an experience we want to have in this city. So I appreciate the um, comments shared and transmitted by email. Um, I have asked several of our staff to follow up because there are a lot of particulars to that situation that I'd like a better understanding of in terms of response. Um, also in terms of further education and outreach to those blocks and users in that general vicinity, we are working on that and um, we'll prioritize it further. Signs have been ordered to increase the signage in the area so that folks using the area hopefully see the signs and understand the transition. Um, like everything else, they're on, on the list of, of the sign shop, so I will get an update in terms of status and when those will be installed as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Um, unless there's any other clarifications from council. I just wanna say I'm distraught that the experience you had um, and to the extent it's in my responsibility, I apologize that that occurred. Yes, we're sorry for your experience and we will work to correct it and have a more detailed response. Um, with that, that brings us to the consent calendar. Uh, items on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. Um, by approval of the consent cal calendar, the staff recommendations will be adopted unless otherwise modified. There will be no separate discussion on any of these items unless uh, a council member or member of the public would like to comment on them. Um, with that, I will look to the council if there's any items that anyone would like to pull for separate discussion. 7-9, please. Nine. Um, are there any members of the public who would wish to speak on an item on the consent calendar? And seeing none in the room, are there any folks on Zoom? Uh, yes, uh, seven seven. Uh, I was also going to mention seven nine and seven thirteen, please. Okay. Um, we will take these one at a time. Um, uh, seven seven. Uh, er, excuse me, one second. Uh, City Clerk, I'm assuming there's no one else on Zoom who would like to pull an item for separate discussion. There is. Go ahead, Estrella. Oh. Oh. Go right ahead. Sorry. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm not sure which item this is. The one about Parks and Rec. I'm not. I just have a question about it. So if I have to, if that means pulling it out, then I'd, I'd like to pull it out. But just a question about the Parks and Rec item. Um, yes, I believe that's seven four. Um, great. Anyone else who would like to pull an item for discussion? Seeing none, I think. Um, we will start with 7-4, which is an advisory body resignation from the Parks, uh, Recreation and Open Space Commission. And uh, if the public commenter can be allowed to speak um, and make your comment. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Estrella Sandberg, and I was just curious, uh, seeing that it's just in the consent calendar right now, when, uh, what, how we will hear back if we've applied, and um, just how we will know what agenda it will be on. I was trying to look for that information and could not find it, and uh, could not find it. Thank you. Can the public commenter give more detail about which consent agenda item they were uh, commenting on? I was thinking it was the one about the advisory body resignation for Parks and Rec, but it sounds like I, it was something. I think that is the case. Oh. Um, I think what they're asking is, you know, what is the process for that scene being filled by a new appointment and when will it be on the, back on the agenda, so whatnot. Okay, um, excuse me, if yeah. that's correct, hold your peace. Um, <laughs> Uh, we will uh, see an informational item on this whenever Vice Mayor Mickey uh, finds and appoints someone. Um, we try and make that as quick as possible, but it can take some time to recruit people, to talk to them, um, and to um, convince them to uh, serve on a commission. Um, so hopefully as soon as possible, uh, but it will depend on Vice Mayor Mickey, and that will be a informational item only because uh, the council as a whole does not need to ratify uh, that appointment. Um, hopefully that answered the question. 
Um, that brings us to 7-7. Seven, seven. Well, well, unless I'll just offer yeah, uh, for thanks for applying to serve. <laughs> much, much appreciated. I see your application here, so I'm sure Vice Mayor Mickey is considering them now. Ah, then hopefully it'll be even quicker. Yeah. Um, that brings us to 7-7. Seven, seven. Um, the commenter would like to uh, make their comment. Yes, um, so 7-7. Seven, seven. I, I remember we did this maybe last year. Um, we did a new janitor service company, um, and it was for the city hall. Because I remember, like, like right now, for example, um, I believe the janitor service is cleaning the, the hallways and, and the city halls as, as we speak. Because um, every city council meeting I've attended in person, there's always a, a janitor lady um, vacuuming the, the city hall and the city staff room. Um, so I was wondering, since it says the money is coming out of the public works budget, in, instead of, has anybody ever thought of, um, instead of hiring a third party contractor, has anybody thought of actually um, creating another job for the city? You know, that way a local person in Albany can apply for, you know, public works department. So maybe public works can uh, say, hey, you know, we're hiring uh, for a, you know, a janitor to vacuum the, the city hall. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the contract implies. Is it the city hall and then they go to public works and clean that building? Um, it sounds like the janitor service is possibly for all of the city um, buildings or city property. So I don't know, that's, that's just where I'm at is I, I would think that instead of uh, approving another contract for another third party, because it seems like we do this, you know, very often, um, is it possible to just, you know, give the job to a public works department and hire another personnel um, to the, add another person to the person, uh, public works department and they, they're in charge of um, jan janitorial services, you know, throughout the community. Um, possibly they could, if they're not busy cleaning the city hall, they could um, clean up Solano, you know, maybe walk up and down the sidewalk, you know, pushing a garbage can. I see in downtown Berkeley a lot. They have all these people pushing garbage cans and sweeping the, the sidewalks right there on Shattuck. Um, but I, I never see that in Albany. So this could, I'm just trying to create a job within Albany, you know, keep, keep the money in Albany in house, create jobs, create opportunities for local people. And at the same time, uh, keeping our streets clean and also our public buildings. Um, thank you for considering uh, what I've just said. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, city manager, I don't know if you have any details here on any of those questions. Sure, Mayor. Um, our public works department provides extensive supplemental services in terms of maintenance of all of our public facilities. This contract is specific to janitorial services which are conducted daily, if not more than daily, in all city facilities. Um, so the, the duties as assigned are currently working and the most effective approach to that work. Great, thank you. Um, Brings us to 7-9, uh, which is the Albany Hill Eucalyptus Project. Um, I believe this was Councilmember yeah. Jordan. Go Thank for it. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that the, they responded to the call uh, in their response, named the, the potential or the intention to consult with um, Ohlone people regarding how to manage the hill as one of the inputs. Uh, I'm wondering, or I guess I would encourage that some compensation be included for that, um, rather than just trying to seek to get that that um, experience, that advice, that perspective for free, uh, particularly because it's it's uh, a less advantaged community economically for a number of historic reasons, and so it's not right to expect um, free labor as a result. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, public comment on this item? Yeah. Um, so just hear me out one more time, please. I think this is a great opportunity um, to, you know, award this contract 
$158,000 to the Ohlone tribe. Um, you know, g give the money directly to them and, and let them manage it. You know, I, I, I meant no disrespect um, earlier about, you know, putting up signs and, and acknowledging the land acknowledgement statement. Um, so I, I was just wondering if, if, if you could please consider um, awarding this contract directly to the tribe and have it be a continued, a continued acknowledgement of the land that we live on. Um, who, who knows, Albany Hill could be one big shell mound. I mean, <laughs> there could be millions and trillions of, of shells there. You know, it, it actually could be a huge shell mound. Um, so just, just please uh, consider, you know, awarding this contract, awarding this huge sum to the Ohlone tribe, uh, to their, to their um, I don't know, their, their fund. It's that way they could use the money accordingly. I just, I just foresee this money accidentally going to, you know, the lowest bidder from, you know, Bakersfield or, or some consultant from out of the area. And it's just like, I would really like to see this money to go toward the Ohlone's. Um, that way they could receive, you know, I, I don't know what they're doing with $30,000. I mean, you could hardly buy a, a vehicle for that these days, but um, with $158,000, you know, that, that money could be well served, um, uh, good put to good use. Um, so I, I don't even want to take another minute, minute, even though I have the time. I'll just say one more time, please. Um, please consider awarding this contract, you know, directly to the Ohlone tribe and, um, you know, that way you could further continue the, the land acknowledgement statement. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, any further comments from council? Go for it. Um, I'll just offer as a geologist, I can say definitively Albany Hill is not a shell mound. Um, that does not say, you know, that it isn't a, a place um, of important history for the people and use of the people, but the, the hill itself is not there because it's a shell mound. Thank you. Um, that brings us to item 713, uh, which is recommendation of a consultant to conduct a racial equity survey. Um, and can we please have a public comment? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, so this is Jeremiah again. So when I served on the Social Economic Justice Commission, uh, we, we did this. We spent a lot of time uh, selecting a company um, to do this. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time doing this. So I'm just wondering, is this a carryover from all the work we had put into it? Or is this, you know, a recommendation for the, the RISE Commission to start all the process all over again and to choose somebody? Um, so that's just a simple question. Is, it, is this a continuation of what the social economic justice had started? Or is this um, plans to start all over again from square one? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm going to let either Councilmember Jordan or Lopez answer this one. Me, you. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is not not a recommendation for this matter to be taken up again by another advisory body or by the council. Rather, it's a recommendation to hire a specific um, consultant, the Justice Collective, to actually conduct the work that the city's been seeking um, since the racial equity impact plan was developed and that recommendation was included. Um, the reason it's coming back now, which is sometime since January, is uh, there were two finalists and the ad hoc committee and, well, the ad hoc committee recommended two finalists and suggested that um, there be follow-up. The council agreed. So the ad hoc committee with uh, staff setting up the meetings uh, had further interviews with each of those consultants following, um, providing them written questions and getting written answers. Um, staff participated in those interviews. Uh, those interviews were scheduled back to back, but unfortunately one of the consultants um, had a key member who um, contracted COVID at the time, and so they had to reschedule uh, for a later date. So it's been a, a long process, um, longer than I certainly would have liked, but we're here now, uh, and I look forward with optimism and hope for what we'll learn going forward. Thank you. Um, with all of that addressed, I believe I will now look for a motion on the consent calendar. 
I will move the consent calendar. I'll second. It has uh, been moved and seconded. Um, City Clerk, can we please call the roll? Councilmember Lopez? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. And Councilmember Jordan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to our presentation. Uh, we have a revenue measures overview. Um, and once staff is ready, we please have the report. Good evening. So um, we will be receiving a presentation from their consultant, NBS. We often work with them on revenue measures and uh, a lot of um, our parcel, they administer our, our parcel taxes currently. Um, but first, I wanted to go over what we put in the staff report about uh, revenue measures that staff are planning to explore or have already done a little bit of research on. So, Anne, if you could. Thank you. So sewer fees. Sewer fees are not new. Um, we assess them on the property taxes every year. Um, the sewer fees are set by council because they are a fee for service. And the last fee study was done in July 2017 and CPI adjustments were set for that fee study through July 2022. We do plan on doing another fee study to ensure that we are properly funding sewer. Um, we have been properly funding sewer, but needs change, and so we'll be doing another fee study soon. Um, we can go to the next one. So storm drain fees and or taxes. Uh, currently, we fund our storm drains in two different ways. We have a fee that has no annual increase. It was implemented in 1992. And then we also have a parcel tax that was implemented in 2006, and that one does have an annual increase. We do need to do, um, we will need more funds for mostly the capital improvements for storm drains. Um, the maintenance is funded through these, but you know, larger capital improvements are, they cost more money. Uh, next, yep, so sidewalk parcel tax. In 2016, the Albany voters passed a 10-year parcel tax. Technically, Sidewalk repair and maintenance is the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. However, people may not know or they don't have the ability to maintain their own sidewalks. So uh, the city has stepped in and is working through um, funding some of the more critical repairs. Um, I think council gets updates pretty often on this, uh, but phases one through six are complete, and we do plan on completing phases seven and eight by the end of next spring. Business license tax update. We've been here before. Um, we brought one uh, last year, but council decided not to move forward with that. And the advantages and the reasoning for this are all the same. However, the concern was that we didn't really have good data to base the fee on, or the tax, <laughs> the rate on. So we are currently in the process of working with a consultant to outsource the business license renewals. And as part of that process, we are going to collect revenue uh, yeah, gross revenue data so that we have better data to make those with and we aren't making the assumptions that we needed to make last time. So we should be able to bring you better data um, after the 2024 renewal season. Okay, next slide, thank you. And the last thing that we talked about are potential bonding measures. Um, bonding is a way for cities to uh, bring in larger sums of money for bigger projects or bigger obligations. And the good thing about bonding is it comes with its own funding source. 
Um, so staff is looking into different bonding, different ways to bond and different types of bonds that we could potentially take out. However, this is a much longer <laughs> process that we're looking into. Um, there was some interest that was expressed and we looked into it a little bit further and with a brief analysis of what our debt capacity is, it looks like we only have about $10 million of bonding capacity before we hit our debt limit. Um, the school recently took out some bonds, <laughs> and so that is that limits the city, the entire city, so like the school couldn't go back out again or anything like that. Um, so this is, like I said before, a much longer term um, future planning option. Yeah, that's the last slide. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, Tim Studerfin. Stufer, uh, I'm going to let him say it, um, from NBS. And he's going to give a presentation on general revenues for the city. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Tim Sufert with NBS. I'm going to go through a lot of information in a very short period of time. So. Uh, know that at the beginning here, but happy to entertain questions, and I'm sure this will get some discussion going tonight and probably for the next few weeks and months, right? Um, I'm gonna break things down in the California language of you know what a fee, an assessment, a tax, because those mean very different things. When you read in the newspaper, special assessment tax, that's like fingers on the chalkboard. You don't put those three words together, you know what I mean? So I'm gonna to try to break that down and make it a little more um, edible, if you will, uh, in the, for this conversation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just go ahead and click through. I think there might be a, yeah. <laughs> so you may have seen this before, but it bears repeating, and I'll be really brief. It wasn't until this guy, Howard Jarvis, came along with Prop 13 in 1978 that you could just set your tax rates at whatever you wanted. If your property tax rate could be 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever money you need, you just did the math. So you can't smoke on an airplane anymore, you have to wear a seatbelt, and you have to live with a 1% constraint, right? It's an important historical sort of bedrock. Uh, next slide, please. So what Proposition 13 did was just basically roll back our revenues to a much lower, you can see in 1978, it, it rolled things back. Before, you could literally collect enough money from water fees, all this kind of stuff on the property tax bill. Um, so next slide. So this is the discussion that we're having tonight. So that's a little bit of background. And then so what filled the gap? What is everybody like yourself, city councils, boards, uh, special districts, counties have been dealing with ever since is looking at a lot of different taxes. Not gonna spend too much time on that tonight, but I'll give it a quick example um, in terms of like sales taxes, TOT, all that kind of thing. There's also parcel taxes, which you are very familiar with. You have them. They basically require a two thirds registered voter approval. Um, there's been a lot of news about this citizen initiative tax where you can get signatures and then it's a 50% approval. There were, I think, 18 of them in last November, which was a surprising number. Um, but if this business round table thing that's on the ballot for November 2024 passes, it would repeal all of those. So we're very cautionary, and I would stick to the two-thirds unless you feel like gambling. <laughs> um, CFDs, I think you're familiar with. That's another type of parcel tax. It can be used for annual um, maintenance and, and also for capital. Um, benefit assessment districts are still very much alive. You have some. There's one on the agenda tonight. Um, but they are, you know, they're legally you have to be very careful in how you uh, put those together and manage them over time. And then there's the whole um, gamut of rates, fees, and charges, um, which Heather was mentioning um, some of those a few minutes ago. So next slide, please. The only reason I bring this up is obviously sales tax is a, is a big thing in California, and that is 
partly in your arsenal, although we obviously have caps that we have to live within. The reason I bring this up is this was successful in 2019, and I believe it was the first use of this language until ended by voters, which you've seen now maybe in many, many measures all across the state. We used to say in perpetuity, but the, the pollsters and the, the folks realized that that didn't sound too good to the public. So they replaced anything that said perpetuity until ended by voters. So you see that language in a lot of measures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that one in Sacramento, that obviously is Sacramento is a large city, but that generates a lot of money, 100 million a year and it's basically in perpetuity. So it funds a lot of things that the community really wanted to support. Next slide. Besides Prop 13, the other thing that we have to keep our eye on is Prop 218, which also has been around for a while, but it's very important in that it added a lot of constraints to what we do, and it also allowed voters to do things like repeal so that's always something that we have to keep in our, in our rear view mirror is, is Prop 218. And again, we could talk about that for, for hours, but I'm not going to drag, drag us through that at this point. Um, next slide. So from, from the sales tax and hotel tax, I'm going to talk about what we call special financing districts, which you have a number of here. And, um, and understandably, um, you know, you'll be looking at options going forward. So parcel taxes, CFDs, benefit assessments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, go ahead and click through all those. I think it'll be easier. Uh, one more. There we go. So I think this helps um, categorize the types of fundings that we're talking about here. So on the left side, you have tax type things, right? That are more general in nature and they can flow across the city without you know, having so much of a pinpoint relationship with who's voting on it or who's receiving the service. On the far other side of it, it's very clear that a benefit assessment district has to have a, a nexus to the property. Um, if somebody's pulling a permit, right, there's a very strong connection. They're making that decision to pull a permit and pay that fee. So there's kind of a, in the middle, there's a bit of a blended, um, you know, for community-wide services and that kind of thing. But this is, it's an important um, distinction to keep um, for, for any of these kind of discussions. So next slide, please. Go ahead and, yeah, click them all in, thank you. So this is just, again, kind of the laundry list of, of things that we're talking about in terms of taxes, fees, and assessments. The property-related fee is kind of a technical jargon issue because you have you have water sewer trash which are fees that are set by council right you can approve them but then there's the property related fee which is like your current storm drain fee if you wanted to increase that storm drain fee you can either mail ballots to property owners and that's a 50 percent plus hurdle to get over or you could choose to take that property related fee for storm drain to the registered voters, but then you're at a two thirds hurdle. So that's kind of a little bit of a, a nuanced thing where um, the storm drain, if you ch choose to increase that storm drain fee that you already have, you know, have had for 20 years plus, um, that is the approval process for it. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So anytime somebody comes to, to us and asks, you know, what kind of um, mechanism should I use? Should I use a tax? Should I use an assessment or whatever? Well, the most important thing is develop your priorities and what's important to the community and what do your community members want and what will they offer to pay for. And then you can choose the tool, right, that special financing district tool. Uh, next slide. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so with parcel taxes. These are the ones that are, you know, we're kind of more on the left side of that spectrum that I showed you a couple minutes ago. You don't have to prove exact benefit, so you can have a, you know, a police tax or a library tax. It's a general benefit to the community. If people vote for it, then it sort of raises the, the you know, everybody's vote, if you will. Um, you do have that two-thirds voter approval, 
And you know, here's some examples of things you can do, everything from you know, open space acquisition to police and fire, that kind of thing. Uh, next slides. So benefit assessments, like the landscape and lighting district you have, um, like a business improvement district, which is also a type of assessment, they are very particular in that you have to prove benefit to property. It's not a general you know, raising up of everybody, but it's very specific. If you're putting in, if you're fixing the sewer system in half of the town, you could do an assessment district and just assess those properties that are in that half of town, right? Like if there was a, a mutual need for that. Um, and that's where we, we still form assessment districts, you know, water, sewer, uh, those kind of things. Um, it's, it's a property owner ballot. It's a 50% approval uh, process. So you mail to the property owners. It doesn't matter if they're registered voters. It doesn't matter if they're Canadian or from other, somewhere else. Whoever owns the property has the authority to vote on a benefit assessment district. Okay, next slide. I already sort of alluded to this. This is the property related fee, which is which a lot of people don't completely understand because it's sort of in the middle of a tax and an assessment. And it's like the storm drain fee is one. There's also things like county service areas, which you probably don't need to bother with, but there are other types of property related fees that could be um, could be implemented. Um, Palo Alto has one, Burlingame, um, Rancho Palos Verdes, Sacramento, actually, we just helped the city of Sacramento pass a storm drain fee last November, I believe it was. So a citywide new fee that in increased uh, revenue. Uh, next slide. Just as an example, because I know it's always good to sort of see what's going on, you're probably familiar with your neighbor to the north here, the Greater Vallejo Recreation District. Um, we helped them pass a parcel tax some years ago, and then it was actually renewed um, a few years after that. It's a parcel tax. It's at two-thirds vote. It helps the community at large. Um, you have to, you know, there's a number of care and feeding things that you have to do with that, like you're very familiar with, but that's, that's an example of, uh, of a parcel tax. Next slide, please. Um, this one is, is, is interesting. Um, Burlingame, you might know, you know, across the, the bay has a very nice Burlingame Avenue, and it was in very, very poor shape, even though the retail there is very sort of upscale. Um, couldn't figure out how to do it. They had some money, they had some various pools, but basically we worked with them and a landscape architect to redo that street a few years ago. And the key, the sort of linchpin in that was an assessment district. At the end of the day, that seemed to work best. The property owners were able to, you know, vote, cast their ballot, and it was like a 75% approval. And that was a, a massive project. It's only four blocks, but it was like $16 million. <laughs> Utility undergrounding to widening the sidewalks to putting in bioswales really, really upgraded that street and took away the old 1950s angled parking and such that they had there that nobody liked. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, as I alluded to a minute ago, a business improvement district, if it's property-based, in other words, it's not business license-based, that is also a type of an assessment district. They're all over California, um, some that are local to you. Um, Kono, right, in Oakland, down off uh, Telegraph First Fridays, if you've ever been there. Um, that's a fairly new business improvement district that's been pretty successful. Um, property owners were balloted, they approved it. Um, the city of Emeryville is a very unique one. I think it's the only one in California. It, um, it's a citywide assessment, basically, but it funds the Emery go round, the shuttle. So there's benefit to property, obviously, and we use like transportation statistics to you know make a residential compared to a commercial, to you know some other kind of use, government use. So they're very you know, scientific, if you will, but at the end of the day, it is another type of assessment district like your landscape and lighting. And there's a lot of you know, flexibility in those in a bid. Um, 
the, the other property related fees that you're, that you're aware of are you know, your water, sewer, trash, that kind of thing. Um, next slide. I won't, you have this deck, I believe, I don't need to go into too much detail unless you have questions, but there's obviously a lot of different fees and rates and things that you um, set as the governing body. And I would just say, you know, you want to update those regularly, and I think you're, you're generally doing that, right? You're, you're due for a utility rate study, updating your fees and all that is an important um, exercise so that you're not, you know, quote unquote, leaving money on the table, if you will. Next slide. This is a little bit maybe too detailed, but um, the cost allocation plan is very unsexy, but it's the basis for a lot of your fees. And it's very important, I know you already do this, but just a commercial, you know, you wanna keep that thing going because that justifies how you um, do your fees and that kind of thing. So a cost allocation plan is, is an important tool as the bedrock for any of these fees and rates. Next slide, please. So this is very redundant. Should you update your general fee schedule? Of course you should, yes, so next slide. Um, this is probably redundant from some of the things that, that uh, Heather was mentioning, but again, user fees, regulatory fees are all, all important to keep those updated um, and um, current with the, the reality of today's costs. So this is just a quick and dirty analysis of uh, or discussion of how you do a rate study it's a three-step process again you sounds like you're going to be doing that probably in the next year or so so you'll, you'll certainly be familiar with this but you, under, you have to understand the financials underneath all of this then you have to do a cost of service analysis how that breaks down between residential commercial you know heavier use versus lighter use and then you set up the rate design, which is what most people are familiar with. You know, it costs me X dollars, you know, per connection or per water usage or what have you. Most of the legal issues actually come up in step two. So it's important that all three of these steps are followed when you, when you end up doing that rate study. This is just sort of a, a, you know, a roadmap, if you will, how to do a rate study well. That's okay, you can go to the next one. <laughs> Um, just an example, across the bay, um, you know, that's, that three-step process was very important. The city of Sausalito, the council, the staff were very interested in updating their, their rates. And so we did a study for them looking at everything from, you know, single family residence to duplex to triplex and really breaking that down to make it as fair as possible. And um, we finished it, it was approved, everything looked uh, great, and then all of a sudden we started getting calls from the Marin Grand Jury and we we're like, uh-oh. <laughs> but actually what they liked was that we had done such a detailed analysis and the Grand Jury actually took the study and spread it to the other sanitary districts in Marin County because there are 15, believe it or not, in the tiny Marin County. So. Um, it's important to do the homework. That's the commercial there is just really understand the costs and how they break down to your various property uses. And with that, we're getting to the end here. So shifting gears from most this discussion of mostly annual costs, right, that you're putting in your budget each year to capital costs, which was alluded to earlier. This is just a, an overview of what you can do with a, with a GO bond, right? A general obligation bond. Is you could, you know, you could acquire property, you could fix sidewalks, you could build a new fire station. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do if the community obviously wants to support that because you do have that, again, going back to the voter approval, you have that two thirds hurdle to jump over. So with that, I think, um, Hopefully I didn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes <laughs> to cover what sometimes takes hours. So happy to take questions or what have you at this point. Yes, thank you for your efficiency in covering quite a bit of information pretty quickly. Um, questions from council? I can't claim to have digested all that. <laughs> there is a lot to digest. It would be nice to have a menu of um, the options. Um, but some questions did uh, let's see, so as mentioned, I think, um, by the finance director's uh, presentation, thank you for that, um, that storm drain fee 
otherwise colloquially known in the trade as the Nipides fee, um, if I understand correctly, is that hasn't been increased in 25 years, quarter century. Is that because, and I think I got the answer, um, is that because an increase is not built into the language by which we we collectively, the city at that time, imposed it, or is it is this a matter of state law that it can't have an increase? <laughs> so storm drain is uh, an interesting one to pick out. Um, <laughs> it hasn't been updated. One, it, it's not written into the language, so we can't. Okay. Um, but there has also been a little bit of talk about how you determine the who's using it. So as we talked about before, a fee has to be for service. So it ha I have to be charging you for something, for a service you specifically have received, or it's a tax. Um, and so the question has been, and it's gone back and forth, in a couple of different places about how do you determine, it's very hard to determine who uses what storm drain and how often and all of that. So it's complicated. <laughs> I know, I feel like I tell you that all the time. Um, but <laughs> this this one is, storm drain specifically is um, a little bit trickier than say sewer. Um, so, yeah. And so is that because, I mean, different residences utilization of the sewer it's different, but obviously they have a connection. So there's the the capital cost of the connection, which is e more easy to. I'm good. Maintain. But the maintenance, you know, I mean, different different people pour different stuff down the drain, and so the maintenance costs vary can vary from residence to residence. So um, that Prop 218 that I mentioned, right, 1996. That's why a lot of these sort of got stuck in the 90s. And you're not alone. I'm Belmont, Sausalito, San Carlos, there's so many cities that have a storm drain fee that hasn't been touched since the 90s. Some of them may have put a cola in or some percentage, but some of them didn't because back then, you know, people weren't thinking ahead 30 years. Um, but if, if you wanted to go down that route, you know, again, that's that property owner thing. And then as mentioned, you do have to do an engineer's report and prove proportionality. So you'd look at impervious areas and do different things. You can make it really complicated or you can make it a little simpler. Um, but to do that property related fee, there is some um, effort involved. The city of Culver City actually did, a, I think it's the first and only parcel tax for storm drain. They just said, we're not gonna go down that engineering route and they just did it as a tax, but they had to get two thirds approval. So, mm -hmm. more complicated. Yeah, I, I'm, well, I'm getting, getting sewers, um, which will be into deliberation, but I looked into the, to the extent that I could, not being at all an expert, but the court record on this and about how much differentiation is needed between different um, payers of these fees and the court records seem to indicate, yeah, some, but not like down to the the hair on the gnat's abdomen, you know? It's It really does fit in the middle of that spectrum where tax, yeah, it just, doesn't, it just needs to be rational and assessment, which needs to be very precise. The fee lives in the middle. Right, because I mean, right now our, our sewer fee is the same per residence. It doesn't matter what kind of residence or what size of residence, but. Um, so with Sausalito, we actually developed it where a single family doesn't equal a single family. It's based on winter water use. Huh. So in theory, when people aren't watering their plants, that's what they're using internally at their, in their home. So we actually measure the water use December through March. And so if you've got the, you know, the little old lady living in a house by herself versus 10 people in a house, those people will pay more, right? And so do they pay it through their water bill or does the, the city get the city sanitary district get the data from the water company and then? Yeah, you can get the water from if Cal Water or from okay. a special district or whoever and calculate it. And it can either go on the tax roll or it can be you know part of a water bill and mailed monthly, bi-monthly, twice a year, whatever works. Well, I'm, I'm loving the sound of that. <laughs> Staff may not like the sound of that, but. Because, I mean, that's been one of my bugbears is that, you know, condominiums on Pierce Street are paying $600 a year, as are people who are fortunate enough to own a detached house. 
like myself, and that just doesn't seem fair. Um, so, but that's deliberation material. Uh, I keep going. Okay. Um, <laughs> is the city's bonding limit wrapped up with the district because we're both in the city charter? I mean, is, is that the case? Because, I mean, a lot of places the school district doesn't even map to a city. It's, like, completely different. That's the difference. So generally, I, I do have to do a lot more research on this. Um, but the bonding debt limit is based on assessed value, and they're, they're directly overlapping. So there's that versus, like, if you think about counties, special districts are separate completely because they ha have to bond based on like what their capacity is and okay. it, it doesn't necessarily relate back to assessed value. Um, but I, I have to do a little bit more research about why exactly ours does. I just know that it does. Okay. So maybe I guess as a, as a hypothetical, if there was a county bond, would that use up our bonding capacity? Is it like point and, and first of all, I want to say thank you for the research you did today and I received by email. I know that was on relatively short turnaround, so I really appreciate it. So county bonds are also authorized under a different section of the California government code. Okay. Um, so they are different sections. Um, I, I also went through that analysis when I was thinking like, okay, why would one be and not the other? Mm -hmm. And my reasoning for saying, okay, it makes sense it's not included because it would be impossible for a county to figure out what bond what their limit would be based on okay this city has this right. and this city is this and this city and what is the so it, it just i don't think it would really make sense for the county to have to also match yeah, but I mean, it's also under a different government code you have a bond rush essentially i mean every yeah you try to like the sales tax rush capacity, yeah the county could take it away from them, essentially yeah um but yeah I, I guess it's an academic matter i would be interested in like why a school district that maps to a city can use up the city's bonding capacity. And maybe that's true of city of school districts that don't map to a city. You know, if you have a school district that covers multiple cities, it uses up the bonding capacity of whichever. I will try to okay. find right. you a Thanks. definite answer. Um, uh, how, is, how, how is streetlight maintenance funded historically and currently? Um, because you know, I presented earlier that the um, uh, volunteer group that I put together looked at streetlight function and found there's pretty substantial degradation. There are a lot of fixtures that aren't working. I mean, the, the electronics are working, but it's like the bulb isn't working. Um, so I'm curious how that historically has been funded. And welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, Council of Devorah Zotter, our Public Works uh, Program Manager. I actually came, I wanted to add a little bit of context about storm drain, and then I'll address the street lighting. Um, the, uh, Heather is correct in that we are looking at, um, uh, that the current funding we have is not structured in such a way to um, essentially fund our program for the long term. The NPDES fee, uh, which supports our operations and maintenance, um, uh, is not, is, is specifically, was specifically established to uh, comply with the parameters and regulations of the, whew, like forgetting to breathe as I'm talking, <laughs> with the uh, um, parameters and requirements and regulations of the regional um, stormwater permit. And in the last year, we've seen an update to that permit with much more stringent requirements mm. and additional activities that the city will have to perform. That will affect us both in maintenance and operations and in capital with things like um, needing to add green infrastructure elements to our paving projects, um, additional uh, upgraded trash capture devices, et cetera. So um, you recently passed the operating budget, which included um, our stormwater, uh, our storm drain operations and maintenance program. Uh, and our current NPDES fee is not able to cover that full program. So we're uh, in, in past this budget. So we are looking at and investigating how we can better, um, what we can do together to find a way to fund that program for the long term with these new requirements especially. Um, the capital revenue source, your Measure F, which is shared between paving and storm drain, it's 
generally intended for capital uh, improvements to the storm drains associated with the roadway. It's not necessarily like a watershed maintenance or capital improvement funding sources specifically for roadway uh, purposes. I, I think I caught everything <laughs> in that. Um, so, so we're looking at that holistically and that is one of the things that we've talked about before as something that we would want to potentially look into as a way to fund a more and more, a more resilient way for the long term. Um, and then uh, Council Member Jordan, you asked about the street lighting. Uh, do you mind reiterating your question for me just because I got sure yeah that's okay drain. thank you yeah yeah and uh, I appreciate your stopping to take a breath <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm so excited yeah <laughs> infrastructure obviously I'm excited yeah. <laughs> um, I love my job yeah uh, so yeah so I was curious how street lights you know just replacing the bulbs for instance has been funded and handled historically um, and that's relevant to you know, do we need to do something different going forward, which is mm -hmm. what we're going to be deliberating. So, and however it's been, you know, I don't know if the reason that so many of the lamps are failed is because there's been a lack of funding or because, you know, it's another system and the city just hasn't gotten to it yet. You know, we've been fixing sidewalks and sewers and, you know, all obviously our civilization here has been around for a century or more. And so everything needs replacing now. <laughs> um, so I don't know, it could be a combination of those two, but I'm just trying to understand kind of the history and what implications I might have for future funding needs, if any. Sure. Um, I can't necessarily speak to, my tenure here at Albany has been somewhat short, so I can't <laughs> necessarily speak to um, the roots of all those problems. What I can tell you is that um, the intention now is to treat our lighting system as exactly that, an infrastructure system. and. We, um, you, uh, an item has been brought to you before, the street lighting evaluation, and uh, our consultant is working on that as we speak. We hope to find, what we, what we expect to find in the evaluation is a couple of things. It's an evaluation of the current conditions of our uh, citywide lighting and, uh, and to help us develop standards for maintenance so we can bring that system into our sort of internal compliance. And to also find um, uh, information that could feed into a vision or a plan for um, a, city, a citywide um, upgrade or, or certain kind of uh, citywide improvements. Um, so the two of those things, so to speak to the question about funding, I, um, Speak to the question about funding. For maintenance, the lighting is a part of our public right-of-way maintenance program. Again, you saw our, uh, that is one of our programs in the budget you re recently adopted. Um, that program is funded by a combination of state highway user tax account gas tax and uh, our general fund to be able to meet some state requirements for um, maintenance of effort uh, with general fund and, uh, uh, and state funding. That the issue with that, with that is that the gas tax is a more general funding source and to do any kind of improvement to the services that are already within our purview, we would need more of a dedicated funding source or part of a funding source to be able to fund those uh, increases to service. The, there are many demands on some of these more general funding sources, including paving, including bicycle and pedestrian projects, et cetera. Um, so any increase in, in, that, in service in that area would require some strategy of how to fund that increase. And the same thing is in terms of a larger improvement project we don't have a dedicated funding source for lighting specifically, so any kind of larger project would need some kind of larger funding source, um, potentially something that could be grant funded based on the parameters of a project that was developed um, between the council and staff. Um, I think I caught all the pieces you of your question. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Much You're most welcome. Huh. I have a quick question to that, though. I, you know. Just really quick, you, you something triggered in me when you said uh, gas tax. 
-hmm. as we go more towards electrification and people, I'm assuming that gas tax surplus is going to dwindle down as we go. So we also need to potentially look at, you know, what's going to replace that over time, correct? So. That's a, that's a great question, and I'll actually, um, I'll speak, uh, say a couple things, but if you have any additional insights about this, Tim, I'm happy to hear them. Um, our, $64 question. I know, right? <laughs> so, um, so electric vehicles and associated funding and infrastructure is a really interesting um, topic right now. There's a lot of federal funding coming in and grant programs to help sort of uh, jumpstart infra uh, infrastructure, and the really, the, the question is how are those things going to be funded for the long term? Is it a government uh, a level of responsibility to do so and at which level? Um, since it is at this time more of a, uh, a privilege to own an electric vehicle because of the costs associated. So with gas taxes in particular, I think, first of all, I th we, my sense is that we have time. This won't happen overnight, this shift um, from as quickly as we are seeing it grow and seeing the economy in that sector grow, the sense is that will take some time. And in fact, actually, gas taxes are experiencing a temporary bump because of the pandemic, because of uh, associated increases in gas costs. Our, our local infrastructure is actually benefiting from having more money to put into paving our roads into um, an associated infrastructure. So it, it really is something that will remain to be seen over time, but we do have time to figure out that question. But it is one that we, we do consider as part of the complicated puzzle that is funding everything we need to do. Putting that into a more general term as well, not just gas taxes, but a lot of the state taxes, you know, or the tax revenue that comes from different levels of government, whether it be the county or the state, we don't really have control over that. And at some of them expire. So for example, we had Alameda County measure B and that was gonna expire. So they brought a new one to voters, which was BB, which added some. And now that B is expiring, BB is expanding. And, but there was no guarantee that was gonna pass. So there's a lot of, most of it is very far reaching. But you also think at the state level, they've had budget surpluses, everything's been great. What if they have a deficit and they decide, we're not gonna pass this through? You know, some of it's written into law, but some of it, you know, could be something that the legislature says, we're not gonna do that anymore. We had that, in, not in Cal, we have, haven't had that issue in California since I've been here, but in Maine, we had that issue all the time. The legislature was just like, eh, this year we're not gonna give you your municipal revenue sharing, sorry. We have to plug our own budget hole. Um, so it, this, again, is a much longer conversation, but at the same time, it is things that staff are keeping track of and making sure we have certain amounts of surplus in each fund to, you know, last a little while. Um, but yeah, those conversations come up often. And then um, I also noticed, and, and thank you for your presentation, and thank you for, for actually answering these questions. Um, one of the revenue uh, measures that you had, well, Two, uh, two spark spark out to me um, because it's things that I've, I've spoken about before, the fact that we don't have a hotel to get tax revenue from, and that's something that I'd like to see Albany somehow make happen some way, somehow. Um, and two, uh, the Emory Go Round. I actually did some research myself on the Emory Go Round um, because that's been something that I felt like our community has really needed um, in order to help support our business district, help um, increase more revenue, because I feel like we have a, a big leak going out to um, Richmond, getting a lot of our, our revenue that could be coming in from um, you know, our residents who live on the hill who may decide that Ranch 99 is closer than you know, coming up to Solano Avenue or San Pablo Avenue and shopping those areas. And so a property owner, a PBID 
uh, would be of interest to me in the fact of, you know, would, would they support putting in funding, and I believe a lot of our property owners here may, may be interested, not the business owners, but the property owners themselves, may be interested in funding um, something like that to move forward to be able to connect our community from, you know, the hill or the village or, um, you know, Terrace Park area, wherever it might be, or, you know, even from the BART stations, the community center, um, to be able to, to funnel people through our community to be able to increase that revenue um, source as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, like I said, it's it's the only one in California, so it's I think it's pretty interesting and pretty neat. But it does fund completely. That's why it, if you've ever ridden it, it's it's free, and it's so it's paid for by this assessment, and it's been going on for I think at least think ten like years, years, right? Has it been that long? No, maybe not that long. It's been it's been quite a while. It's been quite a while. Yes. Yeah. Um, from what I've read, which is very little and so maybe completely incorrect, which is why I'm asking the question, is it is this the assessment district only on the, the businesses and the office space and the lab space in Emeryville, or is it on the entire city? It or is basically on the entire city. Okay. There's a handful of parcels way up in the northeast mm -hmm. that are too far from a stop that don't pay, but essentially like 95% of the city. So oh. residential pays, commercial pays. Um, basically, we came up with an extremely complicated engineer's report, but it's based on trip generation statistics, okay. which makes sense, right? If you have a, you know, a antique store versus a fast food, you know, there's differentiation there in the amount of traffic. So that's really what it is. So yeah, if you own a single family home, you pay a small amount. If you own, you know, Ikea or whatever, you pay a lot larger. Yeah, I guess that was where I got that narrative was that oh, Emeryville can do this because it has so much business activity relative to its population, unlike most cities. Yeah, it is. this one, you know, it so I don't, I don't know how much uh, um, the owner of a condominium, for instance, pays. Obviously, depends on where they are relative to like LabCorp or something, you know. Some, some large um, biotech company. Um, but I imagine that defrays it for the residents pretty dramatically. Yes, yeah, I mean, the commercial definitely pays, you know, many times what residential pays. And they have, they have a huge um, commercial sector there, right? And I, I don't know, remember off the top of my head, but I mean, the annual budget is in the millions, so. Yeah, it's, it's costly, although I'm, I'm interested because the Bishop Ranch has a, or had, I think it, I think it ended, it had an automated autonomous shuttle which actually makes it more financially feasible because it's it's hiring well, and a also driver we're not as large of uh, i mean you know we're one square mile um yeah. <laughs> give or take yeah. um emeryville's quite a bit larger so you're you have more stops you have more rounds this mm -hmm. is a much more condensed location that we're going to be running and and i had checked into some electrical uh, or electric uh buses as well um, and that that research I did was probably a couple years old now but um, it was it was something I was definitely interested in seeing us look into further yeah well, I'll come back to it in deliberation thanks for bringing it up <laughs> um, I think that might be it but let me get my machine going in here so I can look at my list oh yeah um, so if the city wanted to do a broad installation of more streetlights so over you know a large portion of the city um, of those 15 different flavors <laughs> that you put up uh, what would be the ones you know how, how what would your be your prioritization or your first thoughts on you know which is probably the more reasonable approach well if you're g going to put in street lights in a large portion of the city right that's a fairly significant infrastructure investment mm -hmm. to where like the geo bond certainly makes some sense right mm -hmm. if you've got the capacity there to do it um, that you, you would not run into you know legal issues if you were to do like an assessment district mm -hmm. you could do it but then it's literally only going to be the property owners that are by those new lights Right, they're going to pay for it, so it's going to get it's going to get pretty granular, and it Not may really be okay. un, it may be a little bit untenable depending on how the costs break down. 
there. Um, there are streetlight assessment districts, um, but it's typically just to maintain what's already there. They're not paying that big nut, if you will, to, to put in the lights. Mm -hmm. It's typically just to maintain and, and pay for the electricity. So that's interesting. So what, what's the advantage, pro, well, pros and cons of an assessment district to maintain street lights versus just going for a tax? I have a guess, um, but. <laughs> I mean, it's the two thirds 50% is kind of the big political question, right? Uh, I mean, I, if, if you knew you had two thirds support, I'd say go with a tax because then you just don't have um, legal challenges potentially and complaints about the way the you know costs are spread. You yeah. have more flexibility with the tax. I mean, in terms of the, the street lights, so the, the pattern generally in the residential areas is there's a street light on every other power pole. And so if the city were to go after putting a street light on every power pole, for instance, it mm. would only be, are you, are you saying it would only be the, the properties that are kind of, like the property right by the power pole would pay more than the property either side, you know, there'd be a, that level of gradient? No, you wouldn't have to make it that detailed, but you'd have to, it, it would have to at least, you know, make sense from sort of a big picture. You know, if, you've, if you're doing it 500 homes and you're putting in, you know, I'm just picking a number, 50 street lights, you know, and they're more or less spread evenly, then I think, you know, you can make a reasonable assumption that the benefit is there because you have to drive right. you know, or walk or bike. You right. know, it benefits everybody. Whether yeah, unless you're at the system. end of a cul-de-sac, you know, or whatever, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. How, how many, I know you did a lot of research on this, how many, how many different variations of street lights do we have? Because I know some are really, really ancient yeah. <laughs> and some are, are newer. And so, I mean, my first thought would be to update and upgrade the oldest ones mm -hmm. and then move forward with that in, in those segments because it'll, those will be concentrated in certain areas that, yeah. based upon the age generation, correct? So um, my mental model, which may be incorrect and looking forward to the streetlight evaluation um, projects, so it looked like the fixtures we're all roughly the same generation. I'm talking about the ones that are attached to the power poles, not the ones that are standalone light standards. Um, they were all, you know, not the whole fixture, but I think some of the electronics and the, and the bulb, if you will, itself, the diodes were replaced, and our city manager knows this even better than I do, because I think she was the sustainability coordinator when this happened, it was replaced in 2008. So we went from sodium vapor to LED. So when, I, so when you look at the fixtures, it looks like, you know, the, the bulb was changed and maybe some of the electronics as well at that time. So there's kind of a baseline of 2000, 2008. So my mental model's been sun to all of the bulbs needed to be replaced. You know, some question of, okay, I know a lot more are failed now than two years ago because I did a, uh, just a quick survey two years ago. So I don't know if they're like all reaching end of life and it's most cost efficient just go in and replace them all or replace only the ones that are failing. Um, but that would restore the function of those. But that's kind of a maintenance, but it's sort of like the sidewalks. Like, it's maintenance, but now we have this backlog from a decade and a half of, of getting behind on the maintenance, so it's a, it's a bigger thing. And then there's the capital of adding more street lights to more poles. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I mean, it was just kind of a thought process down and maybe, you know, thinking about that in general, maybe staff could come back with a recommendation of what the best process or procedure that or which direction we'd want to go in with that so um so i was trying to think there was something else i think it was um yes okay so something else as far as like taxes fees all of this different stuff uh <laughs> these different buckets um I, I want to make sure that we don't, whatever types of revenue streams that we're looking at, that, you know, we're also cognizant of how much of a burden somebody is already paying. Um, you know, there gets to be a point where we, somebody or a city may start to tax too heavily rather than looking at these other options first and, you know, n maybe not 
going down the road of, you know, continuing to burden more of the residents so heavily in a tax measure, but take it back and find, you know, more grants or the bonds. And I'm definitely interested in that school district thing because I was just like, when you said that, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so, um, so those are, those are just the rest of my questions, thoughts. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for all the specific questions. A more general question. Um, so say I'm a city that has an increasing pension liability and a lot of projects I'd like to be doing more of or faster or a bunch of different things. Um, and I just need my general fund to be larger. What I'm hearing is we, you know, the simplest ways to do that seem on their face nice, like raising uh, property taxes or sales taxes are not as open. And thank you for talking about Howard Jarvis and Prop 13. I will have more negative things to say about that during deliberations. Um, what What is the best sort of large single thing we can do to, yes, to increase our General fund address a lot of those things of, of you know, you, you had the sort of continuum of more specific and more general. I'm thinking on the much more general side, not on the like specifically sewers or lighting or anything. Just increasing our budget to deal with a bunch of these different things, especially pensions. Right, yeah, the, p the pension thing is, we actually had a couple of offline conversations. It is complicated and there are a lot of experts that have differing opinions on how you handle the pension obligation. I am not one of those experts, so we need to get another <laughs> speaker for another night um, on that. But in terms of, you know, the big, the challenge that I'm understanding you're under now is that you're looking at a structural deficit um, in addition to whatever pension issues that we have. And so you need to do, I, 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 not jokingly, but I call it like a five-step plan. You know, the, the first thing is, you know, is your cost allocation plan up to date? I think it is, but that's your baseline. Are your fees up to date? You know, um, and you don't want to gouge, you know, to your point, you don't want to gouge people, but they should be fair and they should be accurate. And sometimes fee increases are put to the back burner because of politics, right? So you have to think about, you know, fees, are they up to date? Uh, fee studies are generally every three to five years. Um, rate studies, kind of the same thing. So you're at the point where you, you know, you're ready to do a rate study to see where that is coming in. So those three things are kind of your building blocks on, on what you need, what you should be doing is like your good health, right? Like eating your vegetables and doing things personally. And then it's, then you go step into that political sphere of, you know, okay, do we want to increase the, um, the sidewalk tax or extend the sidewalk tax? Do we want to do um, a change to the storm drain fee? Because that clearly, you know, that was meant for the old NPDES stuff from 25 years ago it's a different animal that you're dealing with today. So do you have that conversation with your property owners and maybe it's time to increase your storm drain fee, you know, on the properties in a, you know, a rational, logical way. And the people, I mean, if the city of Sacramento, 400,000 people, they were educated enough that they voted yes, that's, that's you know, it can happen. <laughs> it's not a, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a insurmountable task. It's just, it's just hard. Um, so I would look at those kinds of things um, and, you know, then it starts to, you know, you can start to see where you're going to uh, achieve your stasis, I guess, right? Does that make sense? It's distilling what could be a very long conversation, but. Yeah, I, just to follow up on that, because I, you know, I, I get what you're saying and, and I, that's what I expected of, and this was always going to be a sort of yes, and to do everything, of, you know, we should be eating our vegetables and making sure our fees and everything are correct and pay for the services they have. But I think my follow-up or my worry is, you know, say we do all that, we're eating our vegetables, we, our fees match with the services we provide, and we find that for whatever reason our costs are still increasing and we just, you know, need more generally. You know, we have, we've, we've eaten the healthy food, 
we still need the pizza. We're still hungry. Um, and I really want that pizza. Um, <laughs> how do we, after we've done, you know, after we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's there, what can we do over and above that if we wanted to go that extra mile and to bring in more, right, yeah. Well, I mean, you could, you look at general taxes then, you know, I mean, this may be wild, but I mean, would the community support so many hundred dollars per parcel to just keep the, keep the lights on, if you will? Like, that's a hard political conversation, you know? It's, that's why it's typically broken down to, you know, $200 for parks per, per parcel per year. People understand it's more tangible, like, Greater Vallejo Recreation Di District. If you just said, you know, give us more money, right? <laughs> the community is probably not going to go for that. Um, there, there are they're pretty old now. I don't know that any of these are getting passed, but there used to be tax overrides passed to pay for retirement costs. I think Watsonville has it, and some others. Do we have it? Okay, yeah. So I mean, th that kind of stuff did happen, but I haven't seen that voter approved in a long time, right? So it's, yeah, that's that yin and yang of, you know, how well are you uh, maintaining your costs or re reducing costs versus the revenue side. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions from council? Um, how about like um, funding sources, like throw out an example that somebody had mentioned to me is that there's apparently a, a teacher's association somewhere that funds their, um, pension plan by um, owning a building, office space building in another city that they rent out to tenants and the, the rent revenue um, income comes in and, and actually funds that teacher's pension. Have you heard of? I mean, I know some cities are pretty savvy and aggressive um, in renting out property that they own, for example. I know Mountain View does, does that. Um, I just read the other day that San Francisco Unified School District owns the property under the Westfield Mall that everybody's talking about right now. I'm not quite sure how that works. I don't know if they get a, a lease payment annually from that or not. I mean, there's certainly, the, you can do some entrepreneurial um, things like that. Um, but it's just, you know, do you have those assets to, you know, to leverage? Well, I know somebody had also brought up, and I, trust me, I, not, I know this is going to probably go off, <laughs> there's probably many reasons why not, but um, like the Veterans Hall that apparently is for sale by the county for, I guess we can buy it buy for a dollar, but there's all these upgrades and all this other stuff, but it could be a viable rental facility for the city that could generate potential income coming in from that. Um, I don't know if there's any sort of grants or anything that would pay for to, you know, um, upgrade the building and get everything up to um, code there and everything, but, um, you know, wedding venues, and uh, already they, they rent out the space to quite a few things, and that potentially could be some money that could come into the city rather than going to the county, I'm assuming. Any other questions from council? If not, uh, we will go to public comment. Um, I don't think there's anyone in the room. Um, City Clerk, is there anybody on Zoom? Hey, uh, Elaine Stelton again. Um, I own a building on Kings near Solano, and it backs up to San Pablo. And um, I, there's been a lot of discussion about storm drains. I'm not sure we have very many in that vicinity, if at all, uh, because in the past number of um, winters, it's really flooded there, so much so that my neighbor thought that there was something about that my property that might be flooding her property. So I reached out to uh, Mark Hurley that might Uh, Lane, if you're still talking, we lost you. Um, yeah, we lost her. Uh, 
Um, is there anyone else for public comment? We can maybe come back to Elaine if she can get back That's on. It. Okay. Uh, I'll let you know if she comes back on. Great. That's what I was about to suggest. Thank you. Um, that brings us to uh, council deliberation. Um, maybe going back to Elaine when she comes back. Um, anyone want to start us off? I, I can't, but you're a normal one if you want to. <laughs> okay. um, I don't know if that's normal, but oh, okay. I see Elaine's hand. I'm sorry, I have no idea what happened. Um, so in any event, Mark Hurley, who I believe was the head of public works at the time, looked at a, you know, a satellite map and said, in fact, there is no place for this water to go. So I'm very, very happy to participate with other business owners and residents in a tax for, um, you know, um, this service. Um, but I'm not sure we have storm drains in the vicinity. At least it doesn't appear that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Wow. That's all. A willing, uh, willing voter. Yep. <laughs> um, take that. Uh, so maybe to start with the interest you raised, which was the um, raising funds for the general, raising interest revenue for the raised. general fund. I just have to say, you said interest raised, ha ha. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot, and I, I miss it completely. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so the business license tax restructuring, if I understand it, is general fund revenue, and therefore, I think that's our, the opportunity I'm focused on for, for 2024. Um, so in that regard, Maybe to share a bit of what what uh, what we learned last time was, well, where I ended up was differentiating between businesses that already pay and that sell products that already pay a sales tax versus those that that don't service businesses. So you know we got a lot of feedback from businesses that that sell sales taxable goods, which I believe includes restaurants, right? Um, saying, hey, you know, this would be like a double hit for us if you restructure this in a way that, that raises our taxes. And we're like, yeah, that's a great point. Exactly the kind of reason we have a democracy. And so we sort of stood down and stood back. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in, in blending a, a few potential goals into this, should it go forward. One is to restructures that maybe we don't even have a sales tax, we only have a a revenue tax, or I think what's called a, a VAT, in some country value-added tax, um, because the lower the income of a household, the more of its revenue it spends on tax, sales taxable goods, and that's just completely backwards of the way it should be. And so, if we got rid of our sales tax, which you know, last time when I raised this, that was staff again. Democracy staff was like, yeah, we don't want to do that because we don't know, and I can see alarm over there <laughs> already, um, that we don't know how, you know, we don't know how much businesses, um, how much revenue businesses, um, what their gross receipts are, so we can't, how would we calibrate this thing? Uh, but I'll just put that out there again. Uh, another option is to keep the sales tax, but structure the business license tax so that, um, that the business license tax is scales with the gross revenue from sale of non-taxable services, services that aren't subject to sales tax. Now, I don't know if we can do that legally, um, but I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call and because of my home situation, I should, no, oh, I don't think it's a, uh, yeah, no, I, I apologize for the interruption, but I do need to pay attention to home. Um, so I don't know if that's legally possible, but but I'm interested in, in restructuring the tax both for equity and for revenue um, increase. And currently, 
and I mentioned this last time in the last council session, you know, I, I first gave a prize of this when I was campaigning for a measure, and I happened to talk to the, the owner of Toyo Round, and I didn't know anything about business license taxes, and, uh, and she said, well, you know, but we pay this much, and it doesn't seem fair because other businesses pay this much, and you pay more for the first employee than the second employee, and, you know, it, it hurts small businesses. Um, and that also seems backwards. So I'm, I'm interested in trying to both use it to raise revenue as well as to increase equity by taxing larger businesses at a higher rate and not taxing businesses that already are paying sales tax. Um, just a question for staff, because I remember us discussing the business license tax and it being very detail heavy and difficult. Um, so I'm curious if we, and I, I know it was in the staff report as something that you know we're still keeping in mind and still going to work on. I'm curious whether we have an idea of when we might discuss that again, if we are going to, and if we've got the improvements in mind from last time. So, um, like I said during the presentation, we are setting it up so that we can collect gross revenue data from businesses in the 2024 business license renewal period. Bills, we try to get bills out in early December. They are due January 31st. Um, so we'd hopefully have the majority of the data February, be able to, you know, work on it soon after, um, and then we'd be able to come back to you with much clearer data after that. Okay, so that would then make that conversation much easier and have us have a lot more to base it off of. Great. Um, yes, I, you know, sales tax, you're completely right, it's regressive. Um, it's also very hard to do alternatives, as we've discussed. Um, so if we can figure out how to do that, increase our revenue, then let's do it if it's possible. If you know, it's possible within the constraints of our staff and within the data we have, then let's try for it. Um, you know, and I look forward to the discussion we have about the business license tax. As you're right, that is you know a good way to support our general fund um, and something we sort of nibbled around and meaning to do for a while. But you know, there were good reasons we didn't get to it before. Um, and I, I think we will this time. Um, to briefly comment on some other things, um, like I said, I think it's, it's always good to remind people and to talk about Prop 13 of it is impossible to overstate, in my opinion, how much Prop 13 is responsible for the woes of California government in this day and age because it makes it so we have to have all these conversations about trying to scrape together all these other things instead of just relying on the main way that governments are supposed to make money. And that is incredibly frustrating um, and I think deserves acknowledgement. So thank you for summarizing it in brief. And I think, you know, there's not a ton of people with us now, but when we have these taxes on the ballot, it's worth reminding everyone of you know, if you don't like having all of these weird taxes and trying to decide each and every one of them, probably a reason that we should think about this at a state level at some point. Um, uh, my main other thought uh, always, as, as I have mentioned last time when we had this discussion a couple of years ago, um, I'm glad to see a general obligation bond sort of in the works. I know there's a lot of work that has to go into how we do that and what our bonding authority is and everything. Um, you know, I know firsthand how complicated uh, Go Bonds can be, um, but it is, I think, necessary. And, uh, you know, the examples we had in the presentation were all about streets and a lot of other things. The main way these have been used a lot of the time around here is for housing. Um, and I think that's what, that's what I want to see us use a general obligation bond for um, in the next couple of years. Now, we have to do a lot of work to make that happen, and we shouldn't, if, even if we could, we shouldn't do it this year because there, are going, there is going to be the general BAFA bond on the ballot, and whenever there's multiple bonds on the ballot, you have to be really careful because people get really sensitive to having a bunch of them on there, um, and the polling says that that's hopefully gonna pass, but it's gonna be a lot of work. Um, so I will also say that uh, for anyone who doesn't know that that is going in tandem with an effort to lower the 
uh, percentage you need to pass a general obligation bond in the California state constitution. So there's a possibility it might not require two thirds, it would only require, uh, I think it's 55 if that passes, um, which would be really beneficial for us and everybody else who wants to do that sort of thing. So uh, I am happy to see that we're keeping track on hopefully doing that in 2026, which is when I'd love to see us put that on the ballot. Um, and I think that would be a really good step forward. Um, I think that's most of my high level comments. Others? I just want to, on the Prop 13 thing, I, I don't know that I necessarily share your same sentiment of that. And that is because, you know, for example, in my um, business as a real estate agent, um, you know, we have to realize that as, as a person grows older, like, for example, clients of mine who live in the area who can use that to transfer out of here and leave that home now available for somebody, a large family or a new growing family to come in um, because they don't have otherwise necessary resources to be able to go move somewhere else knowing that their, their rate has then now increased and that will keep them in that property and keep that property away from other families being able to move into our community and, and grow our revenue that way. So I, I just want to put that in, in a little bit of perspective because I do deal with a lot of um, you know, senior clients that that is a major concern of theirs. Um, another thing that I'm just going to pick off little pieces here and there. Um, when you were talking about Sacramento and passing that, and you had said something that was very key, and I want us to continue to think about that with anything that we're doing and moving forward, is, is it's really about the education and the communication and the transparency of it all. And just making sure that our community really actually understands what are these things for? What are, what's going to happen with this? Why are we doing this? You know, and and that I think is is probably why so that that was so successful as you said. Um, and then there was, there was something else, but I've lost it. So I will. Oh, the business light, uh, business tax. That's the other thing is that was something that um, I had spoken about before I got into council because. Um, I know as a service business or, you know, like for example, construction, um, you know, even though the project may cost, you know, you're, you're charging your client maybe $250,000 at the end of the day, you're maybe making a $5,000 profit. So you can't base it off of the gross in, in that sense, and that's something that we've talked about. So I just want to kind of reiterate that. So each kind of business is its own unique animal and the, all their profit margins are different. Um, so those are all the kind of things that I just want to really make sure that we keep in the back of our mind that we're fair and equitable to. Um, my understanding is it wouldn't be possible to tax profit. I mean, that that mechanism wouldn't exist for the city or is that not correct? We can't have income taxes. Right, okay. Um, the uh, gross receipts or revenue tax, that's based on revenue that the business generates in Albany specifically, right? Okay. And so to that extent for, say for the example of businesses that are doing construction, they'd all be on a level playing field. In a sense, if we, you know, if we charged a gross receipts tax, they'd all be paying They'd all be paying it, so nobody would be at least at a competitive disadvantage, and they might factor that into yeah, it. Yeah, but you wouldn't be business. <laughs> it, would be, it would end up starting to cost more expensive in the cost of construction. I'm just using that as an example. Right. But there's other businesses that operate in a very, um, you know, look like their gross receipts are very high, mm -hmm. um, you know, but their actual profit margin is very low. And my other concern is because I've spoken to some of the businesses that are in this situation, and they have told me flat out that they will leave Albany mm -hmm. if that's the case. Mm -hmm. They're done. Because mm -hmm. a lot of our businesses here in Albany are independently owned. Um, you know, individual businesses, um, don't like to call them 
small businesses, just mm -hmm. independently owned businesses. Um, and uh, so those are the things that I just, because that's gonna really change the landscape of our business community. Mm -hmm. When we start messing around with taxes in a certain way, if we're not really paying attention to how that's going to directly affect these businesses, our landscape of our business community is going to drastically change. Mm -hmm. Are these, do you have a sense of types of businesses or classes of businesses or any yeah, and, sector and I, that you're hearing this from? I think we've, I've mentioned some of them to, uh, in my meeting with Nicole before, but I think that that's some of the things that we have to, to really examine. And I think that you're looking into several different cities and what the different types of cities are doing. And we need something that compares to kind of our style of doing business here in Albany because it is very unique because we are a much, um, you know, smaller community, more walkable, um, or, you know, more walkable, bikeable, user-friendly um, to get to. And because of that also, um, we have the variations of types of businesses. We are not just a shopping district, or we're not just a restaurant district, uh, or service-based. You know, we have a mix and variety of all of them. So I just want to keep that in, in our mindset when we're looking at those things. Yeah, no. Um we talked a lot about the theater, so it's like, you know, that's one of the examples. You, you want to keep your theater, you want to you like your, you know, like the things that we love about this community that have been um, something that's attracted to so many people here over the course of years, and I just want to make sure that we kind of <clears throat> do things thinking forward in a manner that preserves some of that as well, you know. So the, the cities that have made this transition and part of well, I think as I said in the staff report, part of the reason to wait was to see how it worked out or didn't work out or what could be learned from cities and our larger cities that have done this. They have had rate schedules that are fairly sector specific. So for instance, they recognize that grocery stores operate on a much smaller profit margin. So they have, I think, the lowest rate generally in those rate schedules. Um, but what staff relayed last time was that would probably be administratively not reasonable in Albany because, you know, we, we might have one instance of that business as opposed to bunches of instances of that business like you might in, in Oakland or San Francisco. Um, and so there's there's sort of a scaling issue there. So where the sweet spot is between those, I, I don't know. Um, but I guess to, to your point, and part of tonight is indicating, obviously, as it's clear, there's appetite to to look at this, so whatever it looks like, there's that's I guess the main takeaway for staff is there's still appetite to look at this again. Um, to shift focus away from that, if if I may, <clears throat> um, because of the go bond capacity issue um, and what you shared about the the possibility of an assessment district, if if it makes sense, given the kind of street light upgrading we want to do. Um, that sounds of some interest to me, at least, going that direction. Um, I know I've heard a lot about this campaign door to door, so I would think an assessment district, anything, I think is going to be well received. Um, but if we want to preserve our, uh, our bonding capacity, it sounds like going with an assessment district would have an advantage in that regard as well. Um, and uh, as far as sewer fees, as I mentioned, um, I'm quite interested in what Sausalito did um, to, to scale uh, the fee in some way to size of the residents, uh, use, you know, whatever, um, not just make it the same for every residence the way it is now. Uh, looking at the, the storm fee, I did note that I looked up a couple property tax bills and for a condominium, it's a fourth of what it is for a um, property and with a single detached residence, so I appreciate that. So moving in that direction um, to the extent that makes sense. Um, as far as the sidewalk tax, um, obviously would like to reauthorize that. Um, interested in bringing in 
my, my understanding and staff can correct this if it's wrong, but I believe by the time the current tax sunsets, all of the critical locations will have been repaired. Not that the sidewalks will be, you know, perfect, you can eat off them, but all the, the critical uh, repair locations will be fixed. Um, and so at that point, we will have caught up from the decades of, of prior history, let's say. And so the, the amount of revenue that will be needed to, should the city choose to, to continue to perform some maintenance on sidewalks will be less. Um, and so I'm interested in bringing in now street tree maintenance. Um, so sort of a, this is like a multi-decade plan to have the city slowly take more and more responsibility for what's on its right of way. And I think as we've seen with, uh, with the last council session, you know, there's understandably a, a lot of conflict that comes up around street trees and what I learned from the arborists and that was a lot of that conflict was set in motion 40 years ago because the trees were mis mispruned. Um, and so that created a structural defect that eventually was gonna necessitate taking that tree out. And so we're bearing the cost of that now. And I think that's more likely to happen when the burden of maintaining the trees on the adjacent property owner, just like the sidewalks, you're gonna get a much more heterogeneous outcome. And so as we increase the urban forest, which you know, the, it seems like the street tree planting rate has increased, and we wanna actually make sure that those trees are, are pruned in a way that is gonna stand them in better stead in the long term. Um, so I'm interested in bringing in the street tree maintenance as part of the reauthorization, potentially having some idea what that cost would be, um, as well as watering new trees. So watering new trees is the responsibility now of the adjacent property owner, and I think we'll find out from the inventory. I'm looking forward to seeing how many of the new trees that were planted last year died. I would expect it's a very large percentage because as I walked around, I didn't see much evidence that people were filling the water bags that the city was providing them. Um, so I think the city needs to take on the responsibility of watering the trees through the first couple seasons, and that can be, you know, obviously seasonal work, so that our investment in planting these things doesn't just fall apart. Um, and then on streetlight maintenance, it sounds like we need funding for that as well. So, you know, I don't know if that's a part of this measure. Um, I can see that there would be appetite from my familiarity with the, the electorate in Albany for a measure that would, you know, continue with sidewalk repair and add street tree maintenance and street light maintenance. And then the addition of street lights would be an assessment district. Um, I think that's what I had, but my machine keeps going to sleep and I obviously need to change it's uh, <laughs> how fast it goes to sleep. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I had, thanks. Um. To wrap up, um, and I hear you briefly, I think there's appetite for pretty much all of these things with some details to be worked out later of how exactly we're gonna do them and do them fairly and equitably in the best way possible, but I think the, the overall note here is we'd like to do all this stuff because uh, we know that we have to, um, and we appreciate the uh, action to get it all underway and you know get us to balanced and, make us eat our veggies, and then after that, I wanna talk about the pizza. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, anything else from council? Seeing none? Well, I, I will just note, um, through staff's incredible work, um, our general fund is, presuming it gets signed, uh, is healthier as of the passage of the consent calendar than it was before the consent calendar. Um, yes, it is. So, you know, we passed Measure K, uh, which is for fire suppression and EMS. And what staff was able to come to agreement with uh, UC on provides about as much revenue to the general fund as that measure did. So I, it was a huge win. So uh, the, the pressure's not this big, it's a little smaller. <laughs> yes, which it, it is good to note that that was very beneficial. Thank you for working on that when you were mayor. Uh, thank you for staff for working on it. Um, thank you. A little bit. Um, if there's nothing else, I believe that brings us to the end of this item, if you have everything you need. Okay. 
Um, yeah. We, we'll try to stop having you in every meeting for most of the meeting at some point, but thank you, Heather. Um, that brings us to our public hearing, though I want to check with council, do we need a bio break of any kind before we go, or do we want to just go into it? We'll break, um, say five minutes. Um, so we will be back here at 9.45. All right, recess until 9.45, thank you.
a public hearing, uh, which is on the levy of assessments within assessment district uh, 1988-1 uh, for landscaping and lighting. Hello again, City Council. I'm Devorah Zotter, Public Works Program Manager. And this is a public hearing for the levying of assessments within Lighting and Landscaping Assessment District number 1988-1 for fiscal year 2023 to 2024, pursuant to the Lighting and Landscaping Act of 1972. This is the second step in our annual process for levying this assessment. Per the Lighting and Landscaping Act, the City Council is required to take a number of actions each year that the assessment is going to be levied. These actions include adopting a resolution directing the assessment district engineer to file a report, adopting a resolution preliminarily approving the engineer's report, and directing the city clerk to provide notice of the intention of the council to levy and collect assessments within the existing district for the next fiscal year, uh, conducting a public hearing upon the improvements budget and assessments that are proposed to be levied, and adopting a resolution confirming the diagram and the assessments for the next fiscal year and authorizing filing the diagram and the assessment with the county auditor prior to August 1st of the fiscal year in which assessments are to be levied. On June 5th, uh, the council adopted three resolutions. Resolution number 2023-38, initiating proceedings, Re resolution number 2023-39, preliminarily approving the engineer's report for fiscal year 2023 to 2024, and resolution number 2023-40, declaring the intention of the council to levy and collect assessments and setting June 20th, 2023 as the date for the public hearing today. Uh, uh, LLAD 1988-1 provides funding for the installation, maintenance, and servicing of park and recreational facilities throughout the city, including maintenance and repair of landscapes, hardscapes, place structures, and irrigation systems uh, at city parks, including but not limited to Memorial Park, Ocean View Park, the Dartmouth Tot Lot, uh, the Ohlone Greenway, and Peggy Thompson Pierce Street Park and also includes maintenance of street landscapes as well as supporting our urban forestry program. The assessment has not changed since last year and is set at $75.54 for single family residential parcels. This assessment has not been increased since fiscal year 1993 to 1994. With that, that brings us to the part of our evening where we need to conduct the public hearing and then council needs to take action on resolution number 2023-51, confirming the diagram and assessment and levying the assessments for fiscal year 2024, and then ordering the levies to be placed on the fiscal year 2024 secured property tax rolls. And with that, I will pass it on to Mayor Tiedemann. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions from council? I'm shocked. <laughs> um, if seeing none, um, then we will open the public hearing and go to public comment. Is there any public comment online? We have none, Mayor. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Mayor, we have none. Great, then we will close the public hearing um, and bring it back to council for discussion. Anyone have any discussion? Seeing none, I will look for a motion. I move the passage of resolution 2023-51. I second. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, City Clerk, can we please call the roll? Councilmember Council Member Hansen Romero. Aye. Councilmember Jordan. Yes. Councilmember Lopez. Yes. And Mayor Tiedemann. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Very easy. 
Um, that brings us to our second item of public hearing, 9-2, um, uh, which is the Seismic Safety Soft Story Retrofit Ordinance First Reading. Thank you. I don't think this one will be quite as quick, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just a moment while I pull up the presentation here. How about those A's? <laughs> it'll, it'll be in my regional body report, but I went to the protest game. It was a good time. <laughs> oh, wow. Right on. <laughs> I was like, that's not, that's not the question it used to be, you know? Or yeah, you have to look at those yeah, yeah. I'm, as per usual situation, at home. Yeah. So, did you go? Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. Got it. Oh. Right on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great all many day. Oh, right, Ann Berkeley, right, yeah. it's strollish, okay. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be speaking to you tonight about our soft story retrofit ordinance. Um, you might remember that I was here to speak about this in February, so I'll try to be relatively brief as we go over a lot of the same concepts as we did a few months ago. For some reason, it's not showing. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, so as a review of what soft story buildings mean, um, the technical term is wood frame target story, or WFTS. It's also called soft story commonly. Um, and these are multi-unit wood frame buildings that are vulnerable to a collapse or damage in an earthquake. Um, this is because they have a, a less stable first story wall um, usually one side of the building has, you know, a large opening or something like that, and it can make the building prone to collapse because the stories above are um, larger, heavier, dissimilar. Um, also, in terms of earthquakes in general, there is a three in four chance of a major earthquake here in Albany in the next 30 years. Um, and we would expect that many soft story buildings would collapse in a large earthquake and there's potential death and injury coming along with that, along with many other issues that would result from a building collapse. Um, and mandatory, mandatory retrofit programs for these kinds of buildings are fairly common in the region. Um, you know, all the major cities across the Bay Area, um, as well as in Southern California, there's also some in development right now. Mill Valley actually just recently passed the first reading of their retrofit ordinance as well. This is a few examples of what suspected soft story buildings look like in Albany. Um, you can see with a lot of garage door openings, uh, cripple walls, hillside buildings, even some with large storefront windows. And some of our typical retrofit approaches are fairly simple. Um, usually it involves adding some wood sheathing to the existing walls to provide more stability, um, or in some cases using steel frames um, at the columns in the front. 
This is an inventory of um, what we suspect are the soft story buildings in Albany. So there are about 335 multifamily buildings in Albany. About 235 of those are pre-1981, which is um, the type of soft stories that are before our modern building codes that make them much safer. And then within that group, we're suspecting about 130 of these are wood frame target story. And these are mostly the two and three story buildings along San Pablo Avenue and in that region. Um, in terms of prior action, there's been a lot of work so far uh, to bring this ordinance to you tonight, starting back in 2013 with a preliminary survey of soft story buildings. Um, there was more of a focus in 2018 and 2019 where a retrofit program was listed in several city plans um, and then a council discussion in, in 2019 as well. In 2020, the city hired our consultant, David Bonowitz, who's here with us tonight, to help us develop the program. We held a study session in July of 2021 um, where the council directed staff to develop an ordinance. We held a lot of outreach and meetings with APRA and ECHO um, and developed the ordinance proposal and then brought a proposal to council, as I said, in February of 2023 this year. And now we're coming to you tonight with a draft ordinance. Um, this proposed ordinance is um, pretty much identical to the overall picture that we described in February. Um, the subject buildings, of course, would be these wood frame target story buildings and the would be multifamily buildings, which we define as buildings of three or more units. And like I said, built before 1981, where there's really a distinction in the building codes and the safety level of those buildings. The general process um, for the retrofit would be first notification to all of the building owners that might be a soft story, um, basically those that are three or more units built before 1981 and then a screening phase to determine exactly which of those are soft story buildings. Um, and then in that screening phase, we would also put each building into a tier based on the, the size of the building and a few other factors. Um, and then the building would have to receive a permit for the retrofit work, do the construction, and then finally an affidavit, um, just making sure that everything is wrapped up and recorded correctly. Those tiers that I mentioned I have listed out here. Um, so it's based on the number of units in the building and whether or not there's a unit in the ground story. Um, the units, the ones with the unit in the ground story are a bit more complicated. Um, sometimes the tenants will have to move out during the retrofit work or it's you know slightly trickier. So they have a bit more time um, in, this, in this setup. Um, and as you can see, based on the tier, that really lays out the timeline of when they have to get their permit and finish the construction. So the ones in tier one would have to have their construction completed three years from the date of the ordinance, whereas those in tier four would only need to do it six years from the date of the ordinance. And that just sort of stretches it out for city staff as well. So the screening process is a little bit different. Um, we've developed some tools. Um, as I said, the screening is really meant to determine which buildings are actually soft stories and need the retrofit. And we would have all of those buildings that are three or more units built before 1981 enter that screening process to determine whether they're soft stories. Um, and in most cases, the owner of the building would hire a licensed architect or engineer to go and take a look and confirm whether or not the, the building is exempt or part of the retrofit program. Um, and then we would determine which tier it goes in based on those unit um, measurements. And then the owner would submit that form to staff for approval and we'd put it into our records. That said, we have developed a few enhancements just to make the process a little bit easier for building owners, really. Um, the first enhancement would allow the owner to claim an exemption based on a non-technical condition. So for instance, if we have it on record that they have three units, but it's actually two, they can show us the records proving that and we can exempt them. Um, in that case, an engineer, of course, isn't needed. An enhancement two, an owner might move directly into the program without an engineer. 
um, if the owner, for instance, is 100% sure they have a soft story building, they know it, they don't need an engineer to come and tell them maybe they've already had that told to them before, they can move right ahead and just fill out that form to figure out what tier they're in. And then finally, with enhancement three, in certain cases, city staff could complete the screening for the building owner. Um, this would be only for certain buildings that have one of these features listed here, um, full height CMU walls, no target story at all, or full height concrete stem walls. These are relatively easy to identify and would allow staff to very quickly determine if those buildings are exempt. Um, and again, that would really just be to make it faster, cheaper, and easier for those building owners. Um, this isn't written into detail in the ordinance itself. Um, there's so, sort of vague language allowing the building owner to create a more detailed description of this after the ordinance is passed, but this is the idea um, that we would be using. Just, I'm sorry, you said to allow the building owner. Oh, sorry, you the building, building official. official. Okay, thank, thank you, you, thank you, sure. um, Council Member Dorn. Yes, to allow the building official um, to get more specific about that exact program. Um, we also have a few things in here regarding tenant displacement. Um, there's a clause that tenants can't be evicted if they're required to temporarily relocate due to retrofit work. Um, so currently in state law, there's a, a rule that if a tenant needs to relocate for more than 30 days due to some sort of work at the building, they can be evicted for that. Um, so this makes that not allowable as a cause for eviction. Um, however, it doesn't permit a tenant to refuse the temporarily, temporary location. We saw a few questions about that come up. So it wouldn't be allowing tenants to stay even if they're required to leave for the retro for work to be completed. It would just keep them from being evicted during that period that they're relocated. Um, and then also, like I said before, the building with those units in the work area are in the later tiers, and that's to allow more time to prevent displacement of a tenant if that tenant would need to relocate. Um, and then we would also allow delays of the retrofit work if it would help prevent displacement of a tenant. And then finally, we also have a resolution in our package today as well. This would authorize the mayor to send letters of support advocating for state funding of soft story retrofits. Um, funding for retrofit grants has been up for discussion um, and is currently in the budget process right now at the state level. And there are gonna be multiple points in the coming year where support letters from the mayor might be influential to support that. Um, and the resolution would just provide flexibility to sort of send those as needed and act more quickly as necessary, um, seeing as the council has as a whole in the past um, shown support for state funding of soft story retrofits. Um, so with that, I'll happy to answer any questions. A couple of questions. Um, so let's see, what was the, the, the term that you, the building Official. Who is yes. the building official? Yes, great question. The building official is the community development director, um, who is currently Jeff Bont. Uh -huh. More work. Right? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> we love giving him work. <laughs> um, and then the one of the other questions is: Would um, say, for example, now, okay, and this is, I mean, I'm thinking about the amount of numbers that are there, and thinking about the actual kind of work that actually needs to go in to do a soft story uh, retrofit, <clears throat> which is usually not that invasive of, of an action anyway with you know the sheer walls and whatever else. Um, but in the specific cases where a tenant may need to be relocated and stuff, is that conversation and dialogue only going to be put upon uh, the property owner to have it with their tenant, or will the city step in in some sort of a um, you know um, mediation in order to help the tenant understand? Because from speaking to some tenants, I know they will they may look at this as the owner is just trying to get me out, or you know. So, something along those lines. So I want to make sure that there's something built into place to where the city takes some sort of um, measure to help mediate in these situations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think 
that's not something that's, again, written specifically into the ordinance itself. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, assuming the ordinance is, is adopted, staff's, staff plans to um, develop a variety of documents and flyers and kind of general information, both for the building owners to sort of explain some of the more complicated things in the ordinance, and also for the tenants to understand what's going to be happening in their buildings. Um, and so I think, um, you know, staff can play a role in trying to facilitate that. Um, and I think to the extent that council wants staff to do more of that, you know, you can direct us to do so. Um, and we also do have echo housing, which helps with, you know, tenant and landlord uh, conversation. So I think that's something we might be able to lean on them for as well. There was um, just also talking about mediation. Um, so the, and, and help me out here because I'm probably not gonna say this correctly, but um, there is some sort of fee that um, multi-unit property owners pay to the city as far as um, working towards mediation funding or something, is that correct? There was some sort of funding? Yeah, I think that's the $15 per residence source. for yeah. rent review. Is that what you're thinking yeah, of? Yeah, the rent yeah. review. So do we, how much of that has been utilized and how much of it is left and could any of that per potentially be used for anything else? No, probably not. Um, but I mean, has how much of that that income revenue stream or whatever if you want to, whatever bucket we want to call it. Um, how much of that has actually been used from what's been collected? Kind of a off. Yeah, I, we can get that data for you. Um, it'll, it would take some accounting to do that. It's collected yearly, um, but it's specifically used for rent review. Okay. It, it has so a special purpose, for anything not necessarily. Else. But we can look at the mechanisms <clears throat> on how it was established to confirm. Okay. Yeah. Just, just kind of a random thought process when I started talking about mediation. So. Um, yeah, so we received a number of questions, some of which you've addressed, but to explore the, the tenant need to relocate question a little more, I mean, my big understanding from being a tenant is that state law uh, provides a rental provider the authority to require a tenant to relocate if they're going to do need to do major work on the residence. Yes. And yeah, so would this would this would that existing legal mechanism exist to be able to apply to the situation? To yeah, the the way that we understand it is that um, just as in any other case where repair work needs to be done, the tenant would be required to temporarily relocate, and if they refuse to do so, the normal law would take place um, in that situation. The only difference is that after that 30-day mark, in most cases, the landlord would be allowed to evict the tenant, mm -hmm. but not in the case mm -hmm. that they're being relocated due to the retrofit work for this ordinance. So if the, so what does the state law provide in that situation? If we've taken eviction off the table, and somebody refuses to move, then what mechanism is left? So the refusal to move wouldn't be covered by this ordinance. That would be kind of under the normal state rules. If someone's refusing to move for repair work, um, you know, if it's based on a water heater versus the size of ordinance, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. That's covered by the state law. And the only difference with this ordinance would be that the tenant can't be evicted just because they have relocated for 30 days or more. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just, I guess I don't know what state law provides for in the situation where a tenant is refusing to move. Yeah, I spent some time today trying okay, to find a thanks. specific answer to that and couldn't find one that was very good. Okay. Um, and then there were a number of other questions that were submitted and then I want to thank staff first for so much work on this and for going to APRA and going to ECHO. Um, I guess, well, uh, it seems like that was probably successful, at least in the fact that the room's not packed uh, one way or the other. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, don't know how many people are going to be commenting out in the world of, uh, of Zoom. Um, but a number of other questions that were submitted, and I thank those who submitted questions. 
Uh, we've already answered one, who is the building official, and there was a desire to add that to the definitions section. Um, so the question, can the work be done by the property owner? And this seems to be in reference to a couple provisions, but the main one was there's a requirement for professionals to do the work. Um, and so if you could sort of explain, you know, what latitude and lack of latitude there is there in the ordinance as written. Yeah, and that particular, uh, good evening, Jeff Bond, the community development director and the building official, which is a hat I've been wearing for 17 years. So it's not a new job, new, new part of the job by any means. Really it is, it's just the title of the person who administers the building code in the city. It's not, it's not anything um, beyond that. Um, we would follow, as we do now, state law with who can pull a, a permit for different types of construction. And for multifamily housing, only a licensed contractor can pull a permit. Oh, okay. um, owners of properties, only there's, it's called an owner builder permit, and it has to be a single family, maybe a duplex. But it has to be someone who resides in the residence. And it's, typically, it's a single family home, maybe duplexes. I can't quite remember. Great. Thank you. Um, there was a question about the, and I can't remember the name of the period now, but the 15 year period sort of uh, after, after retrofit is done or during retrofit, you know, whatever. Performance they, period. Performance period, thank you. Um, and so there was a question of tier four, you know, the 15 year period is set as starting when the ordinance is passed, if my understanding is correct. Um, and so there's a question, well, in tier four, does that mean they could be required to do another retrofit, you know, as, as soon as nine years after they've completed a retrofit since tier four, I think, has six years to get it done? <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm going to let her waited all this time. We can't, we can't have you sit on. back. Can't keep you back there. <laughs> he sent me a really good answer earlier today, but I can't remember all the details. So <laughs> let him take it. Good evening. I'm, I'm David Bonowitz. I'm the consultant on the project. Um, they have 15 years. They do the work now. What they're given is within that 15 years additional time to actually do the first work. So it's not like they have less time. They actually have as much time as anybody else. They have a longer period, longer deadline for the actual work. That said, the reason that whole provision about conformance period is in the ordinance is just to clarify something that's vague in state law. So there's already an allowance in state law for 15 years of something, but it's not well defined. So we have it in the ordinance to define when that clock starts and what's required when the time period ends. That's really all that that provision does. Uh, there's no expectation they will, that it will even come into play unless, for some reason, the city decides to pass some other ordinance within the next 15 years that might apply to these same buildings, which is highly unlikely, but you never know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know from the house I'm fortunate to own, we retrofit the, the first level, which is the ground level, and then 15 years later, we continued the retrofit up to the roof line. I don't expect the city to require that <laughs> of, uh, of uh, rental providers, but yeah, that, that can happen. Um, uh, there was questions about, um, there's reference to standards may not be the right word, but sort of multiple standards and some discretion for the building official to determine which standard the retrofit needs to be engineered to. Um, two hazards, I think, out of a ASCE, um, and then, yeah, so if you could opine, opine on that. Yeah, those are not, no, those are not um, uh, different. Those are to give the engineer and the, and the owner options about the technical criteria that exist. Mm -hmm. We put two in the ordinance, They're the only two that have really been used in, in big numbers in any other city uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, what you're, I think, referring to is something called collapse prevention in the BSE-2E earthquake or life safety in the BSE-1E earthquake. Mm -hmm. Those are two different objectives that both work within the standard called ASC-41. They're essentially identical. They're just two sides of the same coin, but sometimes engineers are typically using the life safety version of the same thing for their design or for the retrofit, but if they're going to evaluate the existing building, they might use the collapse prevention version just because that's the way ASC 41 is written. But you don't have to use ASC 41 at all. We don't even expect most people to use it, but it's there 
as the option. But there's no, there's, engineers will read that provision about ASC 41 and will not be confused okay. because those two objectives work together. Okay. Yeah, and I just, I noticed when I looked it up, you know, one has 5% exceedance in 50 years and the other is 20% exceedance and they have different spectral accelerations and. But you're only looking at the hazard level. Okay. You gotta, you gotta work the hazard together with the performance level. That's why BSC 2E, the big earthquake, mm -hmm. comes with collapse prevention, which is lesser performance. I see. The smaller earthquake comes with better performance. I get it, okay, thank you. So those. If you do one, you should get the other one by default. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then in, there is a provision to um, allow either using the California existing building code or the ASE 41. Well, the California existing building code is required by law. You have to allow people to use it if their building right. qualifies. It shouldn't make a difference here because even the California, uh, sorry, not existing building code or historical building code? Uh, it says, it says chapter A4 of the latest edition of the California existing building code. Yeah, that's the one we expect most people to use. Okay, 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 great. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave the rest of it. There, there were some questions about, you know, language and not being able to understand certain provisions, but I think that's gonna be handled by what I heard you relay, which is city staff is going to develop materials so people don't actually have to <laughs> go and interpret the ordinance. They'll be the ordinance is basically building code language, so yeah. it has to be in building code language. Right. Great. Thank you. Those are my questions. Any further questions from council? I just have one other quick. What if we had? Um, I mean, these we're we're sitting there going, okay, these are the ones that we're going to take, and we're going to do it in this way. What if we have voluntarily, or what if we have voluntary uh, property owners who say, hey, you know, I, I'm not part of this first phase, but I'd like to do it now. Or be, is there, um, or, or, do we want to, you know, give any sort of incentives to have them doing that to try to pass through this work a little bit faster? than not, although I know that that would take more work staff-wise and whatnot, but. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the tiers, they give deadlines, but anyone can do the work earlier than that, and that would be totally fine. It, it's not like they have to wait until a certain point. And to some extent, in certain cases, there might be an incentive for them to get it done earlier. Um, maybe you know, they think it's gonna go faster if they're, you know, on the earlier side and get in before most of the other buildings have, or, you know, maybe they found a contractor with a really good price right now or something, you know. So there's just flexibility there. Um, you know, you have to meet the deadline, but if you choose to do the retrofit work before then, that's that's totally fine. Okay, but no incentives per se, but. Yeah, the, we, we haven't structured any incentives in there, just whatever naturally occurring ones there might be, but. Um, and then there was um, there was also the question of see I keep losing it and I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> there's one other question I was going to point to. And now it's also, just, also almost 10:30, so I maybe know, I'll take the the opportunity yeah. to move to extend while you while you oh, think because we're, yeah, we're probably we're probably going to need that. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you beat me to it. I was about to move that we extend until 10.45. I second that. Uh, City Clerk, can we get a quick roll call? Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. And Councilmember Lopez? Yes. 10.45. Thank you. Um, Mayor, if I could just interrupt really briefly, I remembered I forgot to add one more uh, caveat into my presentation. We realized tonight that it would be very smart of us to make a small amendment to the ordinance as we have it drafted here to make the effective date the effective date not 30 days from the adoption, but in fact 90 days, just to give us more time to create those materials um, and do more outreach and answer questions and those sorts of things. So we'd like to request that amendment along with um, the way for first reading of the ordinance. Great, thank you for that clarification. Actually, and I'm glad she said that because now it reminded me what my 
final thing was, and that was on the materials and the outreach and stuff like that. Is that going to be something that we're going to have like a, a look at or be able to, I know it's, you know, staff's work and everything else like that, but would that be something that we could we could see ahead of time before it actually gets launched and, and gets put out there just, um, you know, to try to see if maybe there's a little bit of detail that maybe we can add or I'm just thinking off of my own self of knowing that I deal with the soft story stuff and, and trying to describe what it is to some people. Some people get it, some people don't. Um, and so I was just curious if that was something that we could visualize before maybe going out to the community. I'll let Jeff answer that. I'd like to address that. So um, we'll, take, we'll do whatever you direct us to do. I would say that we probably have 30, 40, 50 forms in our office that we're constantly evolving and changing. Sometimes it's little things and formatting and a new look. Other times it's substantive things because people look at the form and they go, I don't understand this. So we change it. Um, I'd like to have the ability to do that without having come back to council all the time. Um, if you'd like to take a look at the first draft, we could figure out a way to do that for sure. But I would like to keep that ability to fix it, because the first drafts usually don't work quite right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I would suggest that if it be an informal engagement, and, and I definitely would like that to happen, because you have such expertise in this area, and I wouldn't have probably much value add. Yeah. Uh, if there are no further questions from council, we will open the public hearing and go to public comment. City Clerk, is there anyone online? No, there isn't. And we will close the public hearing and bring it back for council deliberation. Um, anyone have anything they want to say? Well, I just want to, again, um, thank staff because no public comment is, I think, a tremendous success in your world. Uh, I got all the public comments by going directly, and I know that's a lot of work, so thank you very much for doing that. Yeah, I'll echo that. <clears throat> if there's... Yeah, I just wanted to uh, also uh, share, you know, appreciate all the work and effort put into this. Um, and I do know there's some, there's quite a litany of concerns around um, tenant and eviction process, uh, should that come, come about. One thing I'm curious about, and I'm not trying to extend this meeting any longer than it needs to be, I know everyone wants to get home, um, is potentially exploring, uh, codifying some language around tenant uh, rights and protections, but also uh, those of the landlords as well, um, to give it some balance. Uh, I was doing some research for uh, to see if any existing language is out there in the state of California uh, when it concerns retrofit work, and I found a pretty nice example in the city of LA, where they have tenant uh, uh, I think it's uh, habitability, uh, I have a hard time saying that, uh, plan or THP. And uh, the tenant has, I think, two weeks to respond, uh, or not to respond, to appeal it. Uh, if they don't agree with their, uh, any, anything stated for their relocation uh, plans that are set forth, um, governed by the ordinance. I think that's something that one gives good balance to protecting tenants, but also uh, protecting landlords who do, you know, I, I think they do raise a good concern. Of, you know, tenants are able to not have to move an inch if they don't want to. Uh, and so finding a good balance where communication can be facilitated and not feel hostile. Um, I know that does potentially add a bit more work for city staff if we do have to require something similar to a THP, to a THP like the city of LA does. But um, from what I've seen, it looks pretty uh, well thought out and could go a very long way in terms of uh, making things feel less challenging or less nuanced. Um, any further discussion? Thank you for doing the research. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. And I guess in, in passing an ordinance on two readings, 
does what we pass tonight, can we make an amendment on the second reading or does that then trigger a need to? Yeah, so typically um, our advice is that it depends on the scope of the amendment and so okay. if, it's, if it's kind of non-substantive in nature, but if you're talking about big wholesale changes, mm -hmm. um, you know, my recommendation usually is to bring it back as a first reading again. Mm -hmm. um, I can confirm that behind the scenes. So whatever you do tonight, let's say you you know, way first reading introduced, take the motion mm -hmm. uh, with amendments that are more substantive in nature. What mm -hmm. I'll do is confirm with staff behind the scenes and then okay. what you'll see next time will either be the second reading and then you can adopt or it'll be kind of a redo of the first reading but with those amendments to the ordinance. Very good. I'm glad I had a question for you tonight. Absolutely. I'm glad <laughs> I could be here. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm, I'm I was going to Ask the sense of the council to to have staff bring back a more definitive answer about okay if we take eviction off the table, you know what is state law around a tenant that then will move. I appreciate the research you did and that 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 work has been done. Um, so I'm inclined to to pass it with some amendments, not those amendments, but with the direction to bring back. Um, if you'll provide the reference to to staff on what the LA language is, and to bring back you know more definitive information on what state law is in this situation, um, so with that, maybe I'll I'll make a motion to pass resolution 2023-52, amending the 30-day delay to start to a 90-day delay to start. Sorry, it's uh, ordinance 2023-4 oh, yeah. and resolution 2023-52. Thank you. Right. So we introduce and waive first reading of Ordinance 2023-04 and pass Resolution 2023-52. And in the ordinance, amend the 30-day to 90-day to provide staff more time to develop materials. Um, there was a suggestion to move the definition section to the beginning. I don't know if. Yes, I do think that that's important to bring that to the front. Um, I'm going to relate it to, uh, again, with my work in the fact like when we get um, an inspection report, um, things are defined first and then it's listed out after. So I think that would be much more of a clear um, way to look at it if you already know what the terminology is and then read it following so um, and also include in the definitions or if the term building officials defined elsewhere include reference it is defined elsewhere in the in the code so maybe include reference somewhere in this section to to that definition elsewhere so people people have it yeah there we go <laughs> I like that, a visual code. <laughs> that would work better for me than a linguistic code. Um, and then again, with the direction for staff to bring back definitive information on, on the uh, tenant relocation, as well as looking into the Los Angeles um, language around this that Councilmember Lopez found. <sighs> Quite the motion. Um, is there a second? Second has been moved and seconded. Um, City Clerk, can we please have the roll? Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Lopez? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. And Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, this brings us to our last couple <laughs> items. Um, uh, first on the Council Subcommittee reports on our regional body representation. Um, Let's see who's going to go first. It's over there. I rolled the dice. I have OK, nice and easy. No, no meetings of the Alameda County Transportation Commission in the last few weeks, so no updates. OK. Um, unlike you two, I had basically every meeting I can have in a two-week period, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm really not joking. Um, Let's see, um, there was an EBC executive uh, board meeting, uh, which I will save because we have a meeting tomorrow where we'll discuss everything again. Um, there was the ABAG housing committee meeting where they discussed a, um, the BAFA's um, rental assistance program, which is a sort of small pilot program that they're trying to put out with an experienced program administrator. It's only five million in MTC funds. Um, so it might end up benefiting us, it might not. It depends where it gets allocated and who goes out for it. 
Um, there was an Alameda County Mayor's Homeless Working Group uh, meeting uh, for the Mayor's Conference, um, which talked about their um, encampment surveys, as well as uh, efforts to create some resources that would help everybody and what we really wanted that group to focus on going forward. Um, there was then the Alameda County Mayor's Conference, um, where we discussed a whole bunch of things, um, but uh, the main presentations were on the Hope Center and Insight Housing, which is formerly Berkeley Food and Housing, um, which has really expanded and done a lot. Um, and we had a update from Alameda County on the Home Together plan, um, which showed basically that we are doing a lot more to combat homelessness, but it's still going a little bit faster than we um, uh, than we would like and faster than we're keeping up with it. So we need more resources there. Um, we also had the ABAG General Assembly uh, where we passed the budget um, and the work plan for ABAG. Um, the budget has the exact same structural deficit that we have uh, driven by CalPERS uh, pensions. Um, the benefit they have is that most of what they, of their staff and everything is paid for via MTC, so their budget doesn't actually have to include everything, but they, they are going through the same thing, and so dues are increasing, among other things. There were some presentations there about uh, economic development um, and geography, which were um, interesting, but I won't go into it too much detail. And there was an ABAC legislative committee, um, which the main note was that they endorsed uh, Wix's bill, which will put a $10 billion bond on the state ballot in March. So we'll not get the same time and not conflict with hopefully the BAFA bond, um, but is moving forward. And I think that's all of them. There were a lot. Can Any I just ask questions? you, you yeah. mentioned five million. What, I'm, I went by so fast, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> Every meeting that was possible. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> so did you say there's five million from BAFA for? Yes, uh, five million in BAFA and MTC funds for um, uh, for rental assistance, um, and that's they're putting out an uh, RFQ, um, looking for an experienced program administrator. And it's, that's for the whole Bay Area. Yeah, it's it's not going to be a Bay Area wide program. Okay. It's it's going to be a you know Targeted. who can who can make the best use of that five million from what the applications they get. And there was there was a lot of discussion there about that, of people saying, couldn't it be the whole Bay Area? And the short answer is no, because that money means nothing if you spread it over the right. whole Bay Area. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no update from the Dean's Advisory uh, Body for the Gill Track Farm. We are working on planning a meeting uh, for July for the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. We did have a uh, Good performance review for General Manager Ryan, who you may remember came gave a presentation a few months back. Um, and I, I just want to highlight one of the major things that came out of that uh, performance review um, uh, overview that we had, you know, with his level of communication with folks. And I think, you know, him being here and the, the responses he gave us when we had inquiries kind of uh, gives a good uh, insight onto, uh, onto how well he does manage his communication and takes his role seriously. Um, additionally, I know last, last time when I had a report for uh, ACMAD, it said that Albany had zero calls or incident reports. I'm happy to report or maybe not happy to report that we had one call last month. Um, and I'm just going to tell myself maybe it's because someone was listening on city council meeting and said, I'm going to give them a call and make council member Lopez happy. Um, the nature of the incident report or call, I do not know. Um, but again, it is a resource out there for our community to use. Um, lastly, there was a presentation around uh, invasive and non-invasive. Uh, native and non-native uh, uh, species of mosquitoes. Happy to share that we don't deal with uh, issues of invasive non-native species here in uh, our region and that m all the cases of um, diseases rooted from non-native species were from folks who were traveling. Uh, so uh, I think that definitely lessen the, the concern or some of the fears that maybe some of us on the board might have at times when mosquito season rolls around. Um, 
crossing our fingers that it stays that way or rather that uh, people who go on travel uh, come back with nothing, come back healthy and happy. Um, and that's my report for my, my meeting. Yeah, I just had a, a question. Um, an issue that, that sort of bubbled up at the end of my term was that they looked at their service request distribution and found there seemed to be a correlation with socioeconomics um, that wasn't didn't seem great, you know. So I they at the time the district seemed to be bookmarking that for yeah, maybe we need to do more outreach to those areas that aren't making calls because maybe they don't know they can make calls. Um, I so I don't know. I don't expect necessarily that anything's happened on that, but I just want to raise that again as uh, something that that I was interested on when I served. We'd always encourage them to have a very heavy presence at uh, the Solano Stroll. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they we're saying like more specifically East Oakland, they've got, you know, far fewer calls per area than many other various parts of the county. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, is there any public comment or questions on this item, uh, City Clerk? No, there are no comments. Okay. Um, that brings us to future agenda items. Is there anyone on the council who has a future agenda item they would like to note? Seeing none, um, we will go to public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment on this item? None in the virtual world. Okay. Um, to announcement of city meetings. Um, I ask everyone to take a look at our calendar. Uh, we have some upcoming climate action, transportation, and planning and zoning me meetings. Um, and finally, it leads us to our adjournment. Thank you everyone else on the city council, uh, city manager, uh, substitute city attorney, um, everyone who joined us, all of our staff, um, and especially our city clerk who did this while sick uh, and remotely. So we really appreciate it. Uh, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.